Section 32 of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lynn Thompson. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Book 2, Chapter 24, The Virgil Book. A man was leaning in the shadow of a tree looking down into the hollow i could not see him very distinctly because though evening had scarcely fallen the shadows where he stood were very dense but he was gazing down into the hollow in the attitude of one who waits for what for whom a sudden fit of shivering shook me from head to foot and while i yet shivered i grew burning hot the blood throbbed at my temples the small hammer was drumming much faster now, and the cool night air seemed to be stifling me. Very cautiously I began creeping nearer the passive figure, while the hammer beat so loud that it seemed he must hear it where he stood, a shortish, broad-shouldered figure, clad in a blue coat. He held his hat in his hand, and he leaned carelessly against the tree, and his easy assurance of air maddened me the more. As he stood thus, looking always down into the hollow, his neck gleamed at me above the collar of his coat. Wherefore I stooped, and, laying my irons in the grass, crept on once more, and, as I went, I kept my eyes upon his neck. A stick snapped sharp and loud beneath my tread, and lounging back stiffened and grew rigid. The face showed for an instant over the shoulder, and, with a spring, he had vanished into the bushes. It was a vain hope to find a man in such a dense tangle of boughs and underbrush, yet I ran forward nevertheless. But, though I sought eagerly upon all sides, he had made good his escape. So, after a while, I retraced my steps to where I had left my irons and brackets, and taking them up, turned aside to that precipitous path which, as I have already said, leads down into the hollow. Now as I went, listening to the throb of the hammer in my head, whom should I meet but Charmian, coming gaily through the green and singing as she came? At sight of me she stopped, and the song died upon her lip. Why, why, Peter, you look pale, dreadfully pale. Thank you, I am very well, said I. You have not been fighting again. Why should I have been fighting, Charmian? Your eyes are wild and fierce, Peter. Were you coming to... to meet me, Charmian? Yes, Peter. Now, watching beneath my brows, it almost seemed that her colour had changed, and that her eyes, of set purpose, avoided mine. Could it be that she was equivocating? But I am much before my usual time tonight, Charmian. Then there will be no waiting for supper, and I am ravenous, Peter. And as she led the way along the path, she began to sing again. Being come to the cottage, I set down my bars and brackets with a clang. These, said I, in answer to her look, are the bars I promised to make for the door. Do you always keep your promises, Peter? I hope so. Then, said she, coming to look at the great bars with a fork in her hand, for she was in the middle of dishing up. Then, if you promise me always to come home by the road, and never through the coppice. You will do so, won't you? Why should I? I inquired, turning sharply to look at her. Because the coppice is so dark and lonely, and if... I say, if I should take it into my head to come and meet you sometimes, there would be no chance of my missing you. And so she looked at me, and smiled, and going back to her cooking, fell once more a-singing, the while I sat and watched her beneath my brows. Surely. Surely no woman whose heart was full of deceit could sing so blithely and happily, or look at one with such sweet candour in her eyes. And yet the supper was a very ghost of a meal, for when I remembered the man who had watched and waited, the very food grew nauseous and seemed to choke me. She's a Eve, a Eve, rang a voice in my ear. Eve tricked Adam, didn't she? And you ain't a better man nor Adam. She's a Eve, a Eve. Peter, you eat nothing. 
Yes, indeed, said I, staring unseeingly down at my plate, and striving to close my ears against the fiendish voice. And you are very pale. I shrugged my shoulders. Peter, look at me. I looked up obediently. Yes, you are frightfully pale. Are you ill again? Is it your head? Peter, what is it? And with a sudden, half-shy gesture, she stretched her hand to me across the table. And as I looked from the mute pity in her eyes to the mute pity of that would-be comforting hand, I had a great impulse to clasp it close in mine, to speak, and tell her all my base and unworthy suspicions, and once more to entreat her pardon and forgiveness. The words were upon my lips, but I checked them, madman that I was, and shook my head. It is nothing, I answered. Unless it be that I have not yet recovered from Black George's fist, it is nothing. And so the meal drew to an end, and though, feeling my thoughts base, I sat with my head on my hand and my eyes upon the cloth, yet I knew she watched me, and more than once I heard her sigh. A man who acts on impulse may sometimes be laughed at for his mistakes, but he will frequently attain to higher things, and be much better loved by his fellows than the colder, more calculating logician, who rarely makes a blunder. And Simon Peter was a man of impulse. Supper being over and done, Charmian must needs take my coat, despite my protests, and fall to work upon its threadbare shabbiness, mending a great rent in the sleeve. And, watching her through the smoke of my pipe, noting the high mould of her features, the proud poise of her head, the slender elegance of her hands, I was struck sharply by her contrast to the rough, bare walls that were my home, and the toil-worn, unlovely garment beneath her fingers. As I looked, she seemed to be suddenly removed from me, far above and beyond my reach. That's the fourth time, Peter. What, Charmian? That is the fourth time you have sighed since you lighted your pipe, and it is out, and you never noticed it. Yes, said I, and laid the pipe upon the table, and sighed again, before I could stop myself. Charmian raised her head, and looked at me with a laugh in her eyes. Oh, my philosophical dreamy blacksmith, where be your thoughts? I was thinking how old and worn and disreputable my coat looked. Indeed, sir, said Charmian, holding it up and regarding it with a little frown. Forsooth, it is ancient, and hath seen better days. Like the wearer, said I, and sighed again. Hark to this ancient man, she laughed, this hoary-headed blacksmith of ours, who sighs and for ever sighs. If it could possibly be that he had met any one sufficiently worthy, I should think that he had fallen, philosophically, in love. How think you, Sir Knight of the Rueful Countenance? I remember, said I, that among other things you once called me Superior Mr. Smith. Charmian laughed and nodded her head at me. You have been describing to me some quite impossible idealistic creature, alone worthy of your regard, sir. Do you still think me superior, Charmian? Do you still dream of your impalpable, bloodlessly perfect ideals, sir? No, I answered. No, I think I have done with dreaming. And I have done with this thy coat, for behold, it is finished. And rising, she folded it over the back of my chair. Now, as she stood thus behind me, her hand fell, and, for a moment, rested lightly upon my shoulder. Peter. Yes, Charmian. I wish, yes, I do wish, that you were either much younger or very much older. Why? Because you wouldn't be quite so, so cryptic. Such a very abstruse problem. Sometimes I think I understand you better than you do yourself, and sometimes I am utterly lost. Now, if you were younger, I could read you easily for myself, and if you were older, you would read yourself for me. I was never very young, said I. No, you were always too repressed, Peter. Yes, perhaps I was. Repression is good up to a certain point, but beyond that it is dangerous, said she, with a portentous shake of the head. Hey-ho, was it a week or a year ago that you avowed yourself happy and couldn't tell why? 
I was the greater fool, said I. For not knowing why, Peter? For thinking myself happy. Peter, what is happiness? An idea, said I, possessed generally of fools. And what is misery? Misery is also an idea. Possessed only by the wise Peter, surely he is wiser who chooses happiness. Neither happiness nor misery comes from choice. But if one seeks happiness, Peter? One will assuredly find misery, said I, and, sighing, rose, and taking my hammer from its place above the bookshelf, set to work upon my brackets, driving them deep into the heavy framework of the door. All at once I stopped, with my hammer poised, and, for no reason in the world, looked back at Charmian over my shoulder, looked to find her watching me with eyes that were, if it could well be, puzzled, wistful, shy, and glad at one and the same time, eyes that veiled themselves swiftly before my look, yet that shot one last glance between their lashes, in which were only joy and laughter. Yes, said I, answering the look, but she only stooped her head and went on sewing yet the colour was bright in her cheeks and having driven in the four brackets or staples and closed the door i took up the bars and showed her how they were to lie crosswise across the door resting in the brackets we shall be safe now peter said she those bars would resist an elephant i think they would i nodded but there is yet something more going to my shelf of books i took thence the silver mounted pistol she had brought with her and balanced it in my hand tomorrow i will take this to cranbrook and buy bullets to fit it why there are bullets there in one of the old shoes peter they are too large this is an unusually small caliber and yet it will be deadly enough at close range i will load it for you charmian and give it into your keeping in case you should ever grow afraid again when i am not by this is a lonely place for a woman at all times Yes, Peter. She was busily employed upon a piece of embroidery, and began to sing softly to herself again as she worked, that old song which worthy Mr. Pepys mentions having heard from the lips of mischievous-eyed Nell Gwynne. In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a fair maid dwelling, made every youth cry well away. Her name was Barbara Allen. Are you so happy, Charmian? Oh, sir, indifferent well, I thank you. All in the merry month of May, when green buds they were swelling, young Jimmy Grove on his deathbed lay for love of Barbara Allen. Are you so miserable, Peter? Why do you ask? Because you sigh and sigh like poor Jimmy Grove in the song. He was a fool, said I. For sighing, Peter? For dying. I suppose no philosopher could ever be so foolish, Peter. No, said I, certainly not. It is well to be a philosopher, isn't it, Peter? Hm, said I, and once more set about lighting my pipe. Anon I rose and, crossing to the open door, looked out upon the summer night, and sighed, and coming back sat watching Charmian's busy fingers. Charmian, said I at last. Yes, Peter? Do you ever see any any men lurking about the hollow when i am away her needle stopped suddenly and she did not look up as she answered no peter never are you sure charmian the needle began to fly to and fro again but still she did not look up no of course not how should i see anyone i scarcely go beyond the hollow and i'm busy all day a eve a eve said a voice in my ear eve tricked adam didn't she a eve after this i sat for a long time without moving my mind harassed with doubts and a hideous morbid dread why had she avoided my eye her own were pure and truthful and could not lie why why had they avoided mine if only she had looked at me presently i rose and began to pace up and down the room you are very restless peter yes said i yes i fear i am you must pardon me why not read indeed i had not thought of my books then read me something aloud peter 
I will read you the sorrow of Achilles for the loss of Briseis. And going into the corner, I raised my hand to my shelf of books and stood there with hand upraised yet touching no book, for a sudden spasm seemed to have me in its clutches, and once again the trembling seized me, and the hammer had recommenced its beat, beating upon my brain. And in a while I turned from my books and crossing to the door leaned there with my back to her lest she should see my face just then i i don't think i will read tonight said i at last very well peter let us talk or talk said i i i think i'll go to bed pray i went on hurriedly for i was conscious that she had raised her head and was looking at me in some surprise pray excuse me i am very tired so while she yet stared at me i turned away and mumbling a good night went into my chamber and closing the door leaned against it for my mind was sick with dread and sorrow and a great anguish for now i knew that charmian had lied to me my virgil book had been moved from its usual place end of book two chapter twenty four Section 33 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckel. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Chapter 25, in which the reader shall find little to do with the story, and may, therefore, skip. Is there anywhere in the world so damnable a place of torment as a bed? to lie awake through the slow dragging hours, surrounded by a sombre quietude from whose stifling blackness thoughts, like demons, leap to catch us by the throat, or like waves come rolling in upon us ceaselessly, remorselessly, burying us beneath their resistless flow, catching us up, whirling us dizzily aloft, dashing us down into depths, infinite, now retreating, now advancing, from whose oncoming terror there is no escape, until we are once more buried beneath their stifling rush. To lie awake staring wide-eyed into a crowding darkness, wherein move terrors unimagined, to bury our throbbing temples in pillows of fire, to roll and toss until the soul within us cries out in agony, and we reach out frantic hands into a void that mocks us by contrast of its deep, awful quiet. At such times fair reason runs affrighted to hide herself, and foaming madness fills her throne, at such times our everyday sorrows, howsoever small and petty they be, grow and magnify themselves until they overflow the night, filling the universe above and around us. And of all the woes the human mind can bear, surely suspicion gnaws deeper than them all. So I lay beneath the incubus, my temples clasped tight between my burning palms, to stay the maddening ring of the hammer in my brain. And suspicion grew into certainty, and with certainty came madness. Imagination ran riot. She was a Messalina, a Julia, a Joan of Naples, a veritable succuba, a thing polluted, degraded, and abominable. And because of her beauty I cursed all beautiful things, and because of her womanhood I cursed all women. And ever the hammer beat upon my brain, and foul shapes danced before my eyes, shapes so insanely hideous and revolting that of a sudden I rose from my bed, groaning, and coming to the casement I leaned out. Oh, the cool, sweet purity of the night! I heard the soft stir and rustle of leaves all about me, and down from heaven came a breath of wind, and in the wind a great raindrop that touched my burning brow like the finger of God. And leaning there with parted lips and closed eyes, gradually my madness left me, and the throbbing in my brain grew less. How many poor mortals since the world began, sleepless and anguish-torn, even as I, have looked up into that self-same sky and sorrowed for the dawn. For her love in sleep I slake, for her love all night I wake, for her love I mourning make, more than any man. Poor fool, to think that thou couldst mourn more than thy kind. Thou art but a little handful of grey dust, ages since, thy name and estate long out of mind, where'er thou art, thou shouldst have got you wisdom by now, perchance. 
Poor fool, that thou must love a woman and worship with thy love, building for her an altar in thine heart. If altar crumble and heart burst, is she to blame, who is but woman, or thou, who wouldst have made her all divine? Well, thou art dead, a small handful of grey dust long since. Perchance thou hast got thee wisdom ere now, poor fool, O oh, fool divine. As thou art now, thy sleepless nights forgot, the carking sorrows of thy life all overpast and done. So must I some time be, and, ages hence, shall smile at this, and reckon it no more than a broken toy, hi-o. And so I presently turned back to my tumbled bed, but it seemed to me that torment and terror still waited me there. Moreover, I was filled with a great desire for action. This narrow chamber stifled me, while outside was the stir of leaves, the gentle breathing of the wind, the cool murmur of the brook, with night brooding over all, deep and soft and still. Being now dressed, I stood a while, deliberating how I might escape, without disturbing her who slumbered in the outer room. So I came to the window, and thrusting my head and shoulders sideways through the narrow lattice, slowly and with much ado wriggled myself out. Rising from my hands and knees, I stood up and threw wide my arms to the perfumed night, inhaling its sweetness in great deep breaths, and so turned my steps toward the brook, drawn thither by its rippling melody. For a brook is a companionable thing at all times to a lonely man, and very full of wise counsel and friendly admonitions, if he but have ears to hear withal. Thus as I walked beside the brook, it spoke to me of many things, grave and gay, delivering itself of observations upon the folly of humans, comparing us very unfavorably with the godlike dignity of the trees, the immutability of mountains, and the profound philosophy of brooks. Indeed, it waged most eloquent upon this theme, caustic, if you will, but with a ripple between whiles, like the deep-throated chuckle of the wise old philosopher it was. "'Go to,' chuckled the brook. "'O oh, heavy-footed, heavy-sighing human, go to! "'It is written that man was given dominion over birds and beasts and fishes, "'and all things made, yet how doth man in all his pride compare with even a little mountain? "'And as to birds and beasts and fishes, they provide for themselves day in and day out, "'while man doth starve and famish. "'To what end is man born but to work, beget his kind, and die? "'O oh, man, lift up thy dull-sighted eyes, behold the wonder of the world, "'the infinite universe about thee.' Behold thyself, and see thy many failings and imperfections, and thy stupendous littleness. Go to! Man was made for the world, and not the world for man. Man is a leaf in the forest, a grain of dust, borne upon the wind. And, when the wind faileth, dust to dust returneth. Out upon thee with thy puny griefs and sorrows. O man who hath dominion over all things save thine own heart, and who in blind egotism setteth thyself much above me, who am but a runlet of water, O oh, man, I tell thee, when thou art dusty bones, I shall still be here, singing to myself in the sun, or talking to some other poor human fool in the dark. Go to, chuckled the brook. The wheel of life turneth ever faster and faster. The woes of to-day shall be the woes of last year, or ever thou canst count them all. Out upon thee, go to. Chapter 26 of Storm and Tempest and How I Met One Praying in the Dawn on I went, chin on breast, heedless of all direction, now beneath the shade of trees, now crossing grassy glades, or rolling meadow, or threading my way through long alleys of hop vines, on and on, skirting hedges by haycocks looming ghostly in the dark, by rustling cornfields, through wood and coppice, where branches touched me as I passed, like ghostly fingers in the dark. On I went, lost to all things but my own thoughts, and my thoughts were not of life nor death, nor the world, nor the spaces beyond the world but of my Virgil book with the broken cover, and of him who had looked at it over her shoulder. And raising my hands, I clasped them about my temples, and leaning against a tree, stood there a great while. Yet when the trembling fit had left me, I went on again, and with every footstep there rose a voice within me, crying, Why? 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 Why should I, Peter Vibart, hale and well in body, healthy in mind, why should I fall thus into ague spasms because of a woman, of whom I knew nothing, who had come I knew not whence, accompanied by one whose presence under such conditions meant infamy to any woman. Why should I burn thus in a fever if she chose to meet another while I was abroad? Was she not free to follow her own devices? Had I any claim upon her? By what right did I seek to compass her goings and comings, or interest myself in her doings? Why? 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 As I went, the woods gradually fell away, 
and I came out upon an open place. The ground rose sharply before me, but I climbed on and up, and so in time stood upon a hill. Now standing upon this elevation, with the woods looming dimly below me, as if they were a dark tide hemming me in on all sides, I became conscious of a sudden greater quietude in the air, a stillness that was like the hush of expectancy. Not a sound came to me, not a whisper from the myriad leaves below. But as I stood there listening, very faint and far away, I heard a murmur that rose and died and rose again, that swelled and swelled into the roll of distant thunder. Down in the woods was a faint rustling, as if some giant were stirring among the leaves, and out of their depths breathed a puff of wind that fanned my cheek, and so was gone. But in a while it was back again, stronger, more insistent than before, till, sudden as it came, it died away again, and all was hushed and still, save only for the tremor down there among the leaves. But lightning flickered upon the horizon, the thunder rolled nearer and nearer, and the giant grew ever more restless. Round about me in the dark were imps that laughed and whispered together and mocked me amid the leaves. Who is the madman that stands upon a lonely hill at midnight, bareheaded, half-clad, and hungers for the storm? Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart. Who is he that having eyes sees not, and having ears hears not? Peter Vibart, Peter Vibart. Blow, wind, and buffet him, flame, O lightning, that he may see, roar, O thunder, that he may hear and know. Upon the stillness came a rustling, louder and ever louder, drowning all else, for the giant was awake at last, and stretching himself, and now up he sprang with a sudden bellow, and gathering himself together, swept up toward me through the swaying treetops, pelting me with broken twigs and flying leaves, and filling the air with the tumult of his coming. Oh, the wind, the bellowing giant wind! On he came, exulting, whistling through my hair, stopping my breath, roaring in my ears his savage, wild halloo, and, as if in answer, forth from the inky heaven burst a jagged, blinding flame that zigzagged down among the tossing trees, and vanished with a roaring thunderclap that seemed to stun all things to silence. But not for long, for in the darkness came the wind again, fiercer, wilder than before, shrieking a defiance. The thunder crashed above me, and the lightning quivered in the air about me, till my eyes ached with the swift transitions from pitch darkness to dazzling light, light in which distant objects started out clear and well-defined, only to be lost again in a swirl of blackness. And now came rain, a sudden hissing downpour, long threads of scintillating fire, where the lightning caught it, rain that wetted me through and through. The storm was at its height, and as I listened, rain and wind and thunder became merged and blended into awful music, a symphony of life and death played by the hands of God, and I was an atom, a grain of dust, an insect, to be crushed by God's little finger." And yet needs must this insect still think upon its little self, for half-drowned, deafened, blind, and half-stunned though I was, still the voice within me cried, Why? 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 Why was I here instead of lying soft and sheltered and sleeping the blessed sleep of tired humanity? Why was I here with death about me? And why must I think, and think, and think of her? The whole breadth of heaven seemed torn asunder. Blue flame crackled in the air. It ran hissing along the ground, then blackness and a thunderclap that shook the very hill beneath me, and I was down on my knees with the swish of the rain about me. Little by little upon this silence stole the rustle of leaves, and in the leaves were the imps who mocked me. Who is he that doth love, in spite of himself, and shall do all his days, be she good or evil, whatever she was, whatever she is? Who is the very fool of love? Peter Vibart. Peter Vibart. And so I bowed my face upon my hands, and remained thus a great while, heeding no more the tempest about me, for now indeed was my question answered and my fear realized. I love her. Whatever she was, whatever she is, good or evil, I love her. O oh, fool! O oh, most miserable fool! And presently I rose and went on down the hill. Fast I strode, stumbling and slipping, plunging on heedlessly through bush and brake, until at last— Looking about me, I found myself on the outskirts of a little spinney or copse. Then I became conscious that the storm had passed, for the thunder had died down to a murmur, and the rain had ceased. Only all about me were little soft sounds, as if the trees were weeping silently together. Pushing on, I came to a sort of narrow lane, grassy underfoot and shut in on either hand by very tall hedges that loomed solid and black in the night, and being spent and weary, I sat down beneath one of these, and propped my chin in my hands. How long I remained thus I cannot say, but I was at length aroused by a voice, 
a strangely sweet and gentle voice at no great distance, and the words it uttered were these, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth for ever. O oh, Lord, I beseech thee, look down in thine infinite pity upon this thy world, for to-day is at hand, and thy children must soon awake to life and toil and temptation. O oh, thou who art the lover of men, let thy Holy Spirit wait to meet with each one of us upon the threshold of the dawn, and lead us through this coming day. Like as a father pitieth his children, so dost thou pity all the woeful and heavy-hearted. Look down upon all those who must so soon awake to their griefs. Speak comfortably to them. Remember those in pain who must so soon take up their weary burdens. Look down upon the hungry and the rich, the evil and the good, that in this new day, finding each something of thy mercy, they may give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. So the voice ended, and there was silence and a profound stillness upon all things. Wherefore, lifting my eyes into the east, I saw that it was dawn. End of section 33 Section 34 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 27. The Epileptic. Now when the prayer was ended, I turned my back upon the lightning east and set off along the lane. But as I went, I heard one hailing me, and glancing round, saw that in the hedge was a wicket-gate, and over this gate a man was leaning, a little, thin man with the face of an ascetic or a medieval saint, a face of a high and noble beauty, upon whose scholarly brow sat a calm serenity, yet beneath which glowed the full bright eye of the man of action. "'Good morning, friend,' said B. "'Welcome to my solitude. I wish you joy of this new day of ours. It is cloudy yet, but there's a rift down on the horizon. It will be a fair day, I think.' "'On the contrary, sir,' said I, "'to me there are all evidences of the bad weather continuing. "'I think it will be a bad day, with rain, and probably thunder and lightning. "'Good morning, sir.' "'Stay!' cried he, as I turned away, and with the word set his hand upon the gate, "'and vaulting nimbly over came toward me, with a broad-brimmed straw hat in one hand, "'and a long-stemmed wooden pipe in the other. "'Sir,' said he, "'my cottage is close by. You look worn and jaded. "'Will you not step in and rest a while?' "'Thank you, sir, but I must be upon my way. "'And whither lies your way? "'To Sissinghurst, sir. "'You have a long walk before you, "'and, with your permission, I will accompany you a little way. "'With pleasure, sir,' I answered, "'though I fear you will find me a moody companion "'and somewhat silent one. "'But then I shall be the better listener, "'so light your pipe, sir, and while you smoke, talk.' "'My pipe,' said he, glancing down at it. "'Ah! Yes, I was about to compose my Sunday evening's sermon.' "'You are a clergyman, sir?' "'No, no, a preacher, or, say, rather, a teacher, "'and a very humble one who, striving himself after truth, "'seeks to lend such aid to others as he may.' "'Truth,' said I, "'what is truth?' "'Truth, sir, is that which can never pass away. "'The truth of life is good works which abide everlastingly.' "'Sir,' said I, "'you smoke a pipe, I perceive, "'and should therefore be a good preacher, "'for smoking begets thought.' And yet, sir, is not to act greater than to think? Why, thought far outstrips puny action, said I. It reaches deeper, soars higher. In our actions we are pygmies, but in our thoughts we may be gods and embrace a universe. But, sighed the preacher, while we think, our fellows perish in ignorance and want. Huh, said I. Thought, pursued the preacher, may become a vice, as it did with the old-time monks and hermits, who, shutting themselves away from their kind, wasted their lives upon their knees, thinking noble thoughts, and dreaming of holy things, but leaving the world very carefully to the devil. And as to smoking, I am seriously considering giving it up. Here he took the pipe from his lips and thrust it behind his back. Why? It has become, unfortunately, too human. "'It is a strange thing, sir,' he went on, smiling and shaking his head, "'that this, my one indulgence, should breed me more discredit than all the cardinal sins, "'and become a stumbling-block to others. "'Only last Sunday I happened to overhear two white-headed old fellows talking. "'A fine sermon, Giles?' said the one. "'Ah, good enough,' replied the other. "'But it might have been better, you see. He smokes.' 
so I am seriously thinking of giving it up, for it would appear that if a preacher prove himself as human as his flock, they immediately lose faith in him and become deaf to his teaching. Very true, sir, I nodded. It has always been human to admire and respect that only which is in any way different to ourselves. In archaic times, those whose teachings were above men's comprehension, or who were remarkable for any singularity of action, were immediately deified. Pythagoras recognized this truth when he shrouded himself in mystery and delivered his lectures from behind a curtain, though to be sure he has become regarded as something of a charlatan in consequence. "'Pray, sir,' said the preacher, absent-mindedly puffing his pipe again, "'may I ask what you are?' "'A blacksmith, sir.' "'And where did you read of Pythagoras and the like?' "'At Oxford, sir.' "'How comes it, then, that I find you in the dawn, wet with rain, buffeted by wind, and, most of all, a shewer of horses?' but instead of answering I pointed to a twisted figure that lay beneath the opposite hedge. "'A man!' exclaimed the preacher. "'And asleep, I think.' "'No,' said I, "'not in that contorted attitude.' "'Indeed you are right,' said the preacher. "'The man is ill, poor fellow.' And hurrying forward, he fell on his knees beside the prostrate figure. He was a tall man, roughly clad, and he lay upon his back, rigid and motionless, while upon his blue lips were flecks and bubbles of foam. "'Epilepsy,' said I. The preacher nodded and busied himself with loosening the sodden neckcloth, while I unclasped the icy fingers to relieve the tension of the muscles. The man's hair was long and matted, as was also his beard, and his face all drawn and pale and very deeply lined. Now as I looked at him I had a vague idea that I had somewhere, at some time, seen him before. "'Sir,' said the preacher, looking up, "'will you help me to carry him to my cottage? It is not very far.' So we presently took the man's wasted form between us, and bore it easily enough to where stood a small cottage, bowered in roses and honeysuckle. And having deposited our unconscious burden upon the preacher's humble bed, I turned to depart. Sir, said the preacher, holding out his hand, it is seldom one meets with a blacksmith who has read the Pythagorean philosophy at Oxford, and I should like to see you again. I am a lonely man, save for my books. Come and sup with me some evening, and let us talk. And smoke, said I. The little preacher sighed. "'I will come,' said I. "'Thank you, and good-bye.' Now even as I spoke, chancing to cast my eyes upon the pale, still face on the bed, I felt more certain than ever that I had somewhere seen it before. CHAPTER Twenty Eight, IN WHICH I COME TO A DETERMINATION As I walked through the fresh green world there ensued within me the following dispute, as it were, between myself and two voices. The first voice I will call Pro and the other, Contra. Myself. May the devil take that gabbing dick. Pro. He probably will. Myself. Had he not told me of what he saw, of the man who looked at my Virgil over her shoulder? Pro. Or had you not listened? Myself. Ah, yes, but then I did listen, and that he spoke the truth is beyond all doubt. The misplaced Virgil proves that. However, it is certain, yes, very certain, that I can remain no longer in the hollow. Contra. Well, there is excellent accommodation at the bull. Pro. And pray, why leave the hollow? Myself. Because she is a woman. Pro. And you love her? Myself. To my sorrow. Pro. Well, but woman was made for man, Peter, and man for woman. Myself. Sternly. Enough of that. I must go. Pro. Being full of bitter jealousy. Myself. No. Pro. Being a mad, jealous fool. Myself. As you will. Pro, who has condemned her unheard with no chance of justification. Myself, tomorrow at the very latest I shall seek some other habitation. Pro, has she the look of guilt? Myself, no, but then women are deceitful by nature, and very skillful in disguising their faults, at least so I have read in my books. Pro, contemptuously, books, books, books. Myself, shortly, no matter, I have decided. Pro, do you remember how willingly she worked for you with those slender, capable hands of hers? Myself, why remind me of this? Pro, you must needs miss her presence sorely, her footstep that was always so quick and light. Myself, truly wonderful in one so nobly formed. Pro, in the way she had of singing softly to herself. Myself, a beautiful voice. Pro, with a caress in it, and then her habit of looking at you over her shoulder. Myself, ah, yes her lashes a little drooping, her brow a little wrinkled, her lips a little parted. Contra. A comfortable inn is the bull. Myself. Hastily. Yes, yes, certainly. Pro. Ah. 
her lips, the scarlet witchery of her lips. Do you remember how sweetly the lower one curved upward to its fellow, a mutinous mouth with its sudden bewildering changes? You never quite knew which to watch oftenest, her eyes or her lips. Contra hoarsely, excellent cooking at the bowl. Pro, and how she would berate you and scoff at your master Epictetus and dry as dust philosophers. Myself, I have sometimes wondered at her pronounced antipathy to Epictetus. Pro, and she called you a creature. Myself, the meaning of which I never quite fathomed. Pro, and frequently a pedant. Myself, I think not more than four times. Pro, on such occasions, you will remember, she had a petulant way of twitching her shoulder towards you and frowning, and occasionally stamping her foot. And deep within you, you loved it all, you know you did. Contra. But that is all over, and you are going to the bull. Myself. Hurriedly. To be sure. The bull. Pro. And lastly, you cannot have forgotten, you never will forget, the soft tumult of the tender bosom that pillowed your battered head, the pity of her hands, those great scalding tears the sudden swift caress of her lips, and the thrill of her voice when she said, myself hastily, Stop! That is all forgotten. Pro, you lie. You have dreamed of it ever since, working at your anvil or lying upon your bed with your eyes upon the stars. You have loved her from the beginning of things. Myself. And I did not know it. I was very blind. The wonder is that she did not discover my love for her long ago. For not knowing it was there, how should I try to hide it? Contra. Oh, blind, and more than blind, why should you suppose she hasn't? Myself, stopping short. What? Can it be possible that she has? Contra, didn't she once say that she could read you like a book? Myself, she did. Contra, and have you not often surprised a smile upon her lips, and wondered? Myself, many times. Contra, have you not beheld a thin-veiled mockery in her look? Why, poor fool, has she not mocked you from the first? You dream of her lips, were not their smiles but coquetry and derision. Myself, but why should she deride me? Contra, for your youth and innocence. Myself, my youth, my innocence. Contra, being a fool in grain, didn't you boast that you had known but few women? Myself, I did, but... Contra, didn't she call you boy, 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 and laugh at you? Myself, well... Even so, Contra, with bitter scorn, Oh, boy, oh, innocent of the innocent, Go to for a bookish fool, Learn that lovely ladies yield themselves But to those who are masterful in their wooing, Who have wooed often and triumphed as often. Oh, innocent of the innocent, Forget the maudlin sentiment of thy books And old romances, Thy pure Sir Galahads, Thy, quote, very parfait, gentil knights, unquote thy meek and lowly lovers, serving their ladies on bended knee. Open thine eyes. Learn that women to-day love only the strong hand, the bold eye, the ready tongue. Kneel to her, and she will scorn and contemn you. What woman, think you, would prefer the solemn, stern-eyed purity of a Sir Galahad, though he be the king of men, to the quick-witted gaiety of a debonair Lothario, though he be but the shadow of a man? Out upon thee, pale-faced student! Thy tongue hath not the trick, nor thy mind the nimbleness for the winning of a fair and lovely lady. Thou art well enough in want of a better, but when Lothario comes, must she not run to meet him with arms outstretched? To-morrow, said I, clenching my fists, to-morrow I will go away. Being now come to the hollow, I turned aside to the brook at that place where was the pool in which I was wont to perform my morning ablutions, and kneeling down I gazed at myself in the dark, still water, and I saw that the night had indeed set its mark upon me. "'Tomorrow,' said I again, nodding to the wild face below, "'tomorrow I will go far hence.' Now while I yet gazed at myself I heard a sudden gasp behind me, and turning, beheld Charmian. "'Peter, is it you?' she whispered, drawing back from me. "'Who else, Charmian? Did I startle you?' "'Yes. Oh, Peter, are you afraid of me? You are like one who has walked with death.' I rose to my feet and stood looking down at her. Are you afraid of me, Charmian? No, Peter. I am glad of that, said I, because I want to ask you to marry me, Charmian. End of In Which I Come to a Determination
Section 35 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 29. In which Charmian answers my question. Peter! Yes? I wish you wouldn't. Wouldn't what, Charmian? Stir your tea round and round and round. It's really most exasperating. I beg your pardon, said I humbly. And you eat nothing, and that is also exasperating. I am not hungry. And I was so careful with the bacon. See, it is fried. Beautifully. Yes, you are very exasperating, Peter. Here, finding I was absent-mindedly stirring my tea round and round again, I gulped it down out of the way whereupon charmian took my cup and refilled it having done which she set her elbows upon the table and propping her chin in her hands looked at me you climbed out through your window last night peter yes it must have been a dreadfully tight squeeze yes and why did you go by the window i did not wish to disturb you that was very thoughtful of you only you see i was up and dressed the roar of the thunder woke me it was a dreadful storm peter yes the lightning was awful yes and you were out in it yes oh you poor poor peter how cold you must have been on the contrary i began i and wet peter miserably wet and clammy i did not notice i murmured being a philosopher peter and too much engrossed in your thoughts i was certainly thinking of yourself yes you are a great egoist aren't you peter am i charmian who but an egoist could stand with his mind so full of himself and his own concerns as to be oblivious to thunder and lightning and not know that he is miserable, clammy, and wet? I thought of others beside myself. But only in connection with yourself, everything you have ever read or seen you apply to yourself to make that self more worthy in Mr. Vibart's eyes. Is this worthy of Peter Vibart? Can Peter Vibart do this, that, or the other, and still retain the respect of Peter Vibart? Then why, being in all things so very correct and precise, why is Peter Vibart given to prowling abroad at midnight, quite oblivious to thunder, lightning, wet, and clamminess? I answer, because Peter Vibart is too much engrossed by Peter Vibart. There! That sounds rather cryptic and very full of Peter Vibart, but that is as it should be. And she laughed. And what does it mean, Charmian? Good sir, the Sibyl hath spoken. Find her meaning for yourself. You have called me on various occasions a creature, a pedant, very frequently a pedant, and now it seems I'm an egoist, and all because... Because you think too much, Peter. You never open your lips without having first thought out just what you are going to say. You never do anything without having laboriously mapped it all out beforehand, that you may not outrage Peter Vibart's tranquillity by an impulsive act or speech. Oh, you are always thinking and thinking and that is even worse than stirring and stirring at your tea as you are doing now. I took the spoon hastily from my cup and laid it as far out of reach as possible. If ever you write the book you once spoke of, it would be just the sort of book that I should hate. Why, Charmian? Because it would be a book of artfully turned phrases, a book in which all the characters, especially women, would think and speak and act by rote and rule, as according to Mr. Peter Vibart. It would be a scholarly book of elaborate finish and care of detail, with no irregularities of style or anything else to break the monotonous harmony of the whole. Indeed, sir, it would be a most unreadable book. Do you think so, Charmian? said I once more, taking up the teaspoon. Why, of course, she answered with raised brows. It would probably be full of Greek and Latin quotations, and you would polish and rewrite until you had polished every vestige of life and spontaneity out of it as you do out of yourself with your thinking and thinking. But I never quote you Greek or Latin. That is surely something. And as for thinking, would you have me a thoughtless fool or an impulsive ass? Anything rather than a calculating, introspective philosopher, seeing only the mote in the sunbeam and nothing of the glory. Here she gently disengaged the teaspoon from my fingers and laid it in her own saucer, having done which she sighed and looked at me with her head to one side. Were they all like you, Peter, I wonder? those old philosophers, grim and stern and terribly repressed, with burning eyes, Peter, and very long chins. Epictetus was, of course. And you dislike Epictetus, Charmian? I detest him. 
He was just the kind of person, Peter, who, being unable to sleep, would have wandered out into a terrible thunderstorm in the middle of the night, and being cold and wet and clammy, Peter, would have drawn moral lessons and made epigrams upon the thunder and lightning. Epictetus, I am sure, was a person. He was one of the wisest, gentlest, and most lovable of all the Stoics, said I. Can a philosopher possibly be lovable, Peter? Here I very absent-mindedly took up a fork, but finding her eye upon me laid it down again. You are very nervous, Peter, and very pale and worn and haggard, and all because you habitually overthink yourself. And indeed there is something very far wrong with a man who perseveringly stirs an empty cup with a fork, and with a laugh she took my cup and, having once more refilled it, set it before me. And yet, Peter, I don't think, no, I don't think I would have you very much changed after all. You mean that you would rather I remained the pedantic, egotistical creature? I mean, Peter, that being a woman I naturally love novelty, and you are very novel, and very interesting. Thank you, said I, frowning, and more contradictory than any woman. Hm, said I. You are so strong and simple, so wise and brave, so very weak and foolish and timid. Timid? said I. Timid, nodded she. I am a vast fool, I acknowledged and I never knew a man anything like you before, Peter. And you have known many, I understand. Very many. Yes, you told me so once before, I believe. Twice, Peter, and each time you became very silent and gloomy. Now you, on the other hand, she continued, have known very few women, and my life has been calm and unruffled in consequence. You had your books, Peter, and your horseshoes. My books and horseshoes, yes. And were content? Quite content. Until one day a woman came to you. Until one day I met a woman. And then? And then I asked her to marry me, Charmian. Here there ensued a pause, during which Charmian began to pleat a fold in the tablecloth. That was rather unwise of you, wasn't it? said she at last. How unwise? Because she might have taken you at your word, Peter. Do you mean that? That you won't, Charmian? Oh, dear, no. I have arrived at no decision yet. How could I? You must give me time to consider. Here she paused in her pleading to regard it critically, with her head on one side. To be sure, said she with a little nod, to be sure you need someone to look after you. That is very evident. Yes. To cook and wash for you? Yes. To mend your clothes for you? Yes. And you think me sufficiently competent? Oh, Charmian, I... Yes. Thank you, said she, very solemnly, and though her lashes had drooped, I felt the mockery of her eyes. Wherefore, I took a sudden great gulp of tea and came near choking, while Charmian began to pleat another fold in the tablecloth. And so Mr. Vibart would stoop to wed so humble a person as Charmian Brown. Mr. Vibart would, actually, marry a woman of whose past he knows nothing. Yes, said I. That again would be rather unwise, wouldn't it? Why? Considering Mr. Vibart's very lofty ideals in regard to women. What do you mean? Didn't you once say that your wife's name must be above suspicion, like Caesar's, or something of the kind? Did I? Yes, perhaps I did. Well? Well, this woman, this humble person, has no name at all, and no shred of reputation left her. She has compromised herself beyond all redemption in the eyes of the world. But then, said I, this world and I have always mutually despised each other. She ran away, this woman, eloped with the most notorious the most accomplished rake in London. Well, oh, is that not enough? Enough for what, Charmian? I saw her busy fingers falter and tremble, but her voice was steady when she answered, enough to make any wise man think twice before asking this humble person to marry him. I might think twenty times, and it would be all one. You mean that if Charmian Brown will stoop to marry a village blacksmith, Peter Vibart will find happiness again, a happiness that is not of the sunshine, nor the wind in the trees. Lord, what a fool I was! Her fingers had stopped altogether now, but she neither spoke nor raised her head. Charmian, said I, leaning nearer across the table, speak. Oh, Peter, said she, with a sudden break in her voice, and stooped her head lower, yet in a little she looked up at me, and her eyes were very sweet and shining. Now as our glances met thus, up from throat to brow, there crept that hot, slow wave of color, and in her face and in her eyes I seemed to read joy and fear and shame and radiant joy again. But now she bent her head once more, and strove to plead another fold, and could not. 
while I grew suddenly afraid of her and of myself, and longed to hurl aside the table that divided us, and thrust my hands deep into my pockets, and finding there my tobacco pipe, brought it out and fell to turning it aimlessly over and over. I would have spoken, only I knew that my voice would tremble, so I sat mum chance, staring at my pipe with unseeing eyes, and with my brain in a ferment. And presently came her voice, cool and sweet and sane. "'Your tobacco, Peter,' and she held the box toward me across the table. "'Ah, thank you,' said I, and began to fill my pipe, while she watched me, with her chin propped in her hands. "'Peter.' "'Yes, Charmian. I wonder why so grave a person as Mr. Peter Vibart should seek to marry so impossible a creature as the humble person.' "'I think,' I answered, "'I think if there is any special reason it is because of your mouth.' "'My mouth? Or your eyes? Or the way you have with your lashes?' Charmian laughed, and forthwith drooped them at me, and laughed again and shook her head. But surely, Peter, surely there are thousands, millions of women with mouths and eyes like the humble persons. It is possible, said I, but none who have the same way with their lashes. What do you mean? I can't tell. I don't know. Don't you, Peter? No, it is just a way. And so it is that you want to marry this very humble person? I think I have wanted to from the very first, but did not know it, being a blind fool. And... Did it need a night walk in a thunderstorm to teach you? No, that is, yes, perhaps it did. And are you quite, quite sure? Quite, quite sure, said I. And as I spoke, I laid my pipe upon the table and rose, and because my hands were trembling, I clenched my fists. But as I approached her, she started up and put out a hand to hold me off, and then I saw that her hands were trembling also. And standing thus, she spoke very softly, Peter. "'Yes, Charmian. Do you remember describing to me the perfect woman who should be your wife? Yes. How, that you must be able to respect her for her intellect? Yes. Honor her for her virtue? Yes, Charmian. And worship her for her spotless purity? I dreamed a paragon, perfect and impossible. I was a fool,' said I. "'Impossible? Oh, Peter, w what do you mean?' She was only an impalpable shade, quite impossible of realization, a bloodless thing, as you said, and quite unnatural, a sickly figment of the imagination. I was a fool. And you are too wise now to expect such virtues in any woman? Yes, said I. N no. Oh, Charmian, I only know that you have taken this phantom's place, that you fill all my thoughts, sleeping and waking. No, no, she cried, and struggled in my arms so that I caught her hands, and held them close, and kissed them many times. Oh, Charmian, Charmian, don't you know? Can't you see? It is you I want, you, and only you forever. Whatever you were, whatever you are, I love you, love you, and always must. Marry me, Charmian. Marry me, and you shall be dearer than my life, more to me than my soul. But as I spoke, her hands were snatched away, her eyes blazed into mine, and her lips were all bitter scorn, and at the sight fear came upon me. "'Marry you!' she panted. "'Marry you! No, and no, and no!' And so she stamped her foot and sobbed, and turning fled from me out of the cottage. And now to fear came wonder, and with wonder was despair. Truly was ever man so great a fool. End of In Which Charmian Answers My Question Section 36 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 30. Concerning the Fate of Black George. A broad white road, on either hand some half-dozen cottages, with roofs of thatch or red tile backed by trees gnarled and ancient, among which rises the red conical roof of some Osthaus. Such, in a word, is Sissinghurst. Now upon the left-hand side of the way there stands a square, comfortable, whitewashed building, peaked of roof, bright as to windows, and with a mighty sign before the door, whereon you shall behold the picture of a bull, a bull rolling of eye, astonishingly curly of horn, and stiff as to tail and with a prodigious girth of neck and shoulder, such a snorting, fiery-eyed, curly-horned bull as was never seen off an inn sign. 
it was at this bull that I was staring, with much apparent interest. Though, indeed, had that same curly-horned monstrosity been changed by some enchanter's wand into a green dragon, or a griffin, or swan with two necks, the chances are that I should have continued sublimely unconscious of the transformation. Yet how should honest Silas Hoskins, ostler, and general factotum of the Bull Inn, be aware of this fact, who, being thus early at work, and seeing me lost in contemplation, paused to address me in all good faith. "'A fine bully be, eh, Peter? Look at them horns, and that dear tail. It's seldom as you sees horns or a tail like a them, eh?' "'Very seldom,' I answered, and sighed. "'And then is nose holes, Peter. Just cast your eyes on them nose holes, will ya? Why, dang me, if I can't hear him a-snortin' when I looks at him. And he were all painted by a chap, a little old chap with grey whiskers no taller than your elber, Peter. Think of that, a little chap no taller than your elber. I seen him do it my own two eyes, a-sittin' on a box. Drored to bull with a bit of chalk first, then he outs with a couple of brushes. Dab he goes, and dab, dab again, and by goals there was a pair of eyes a-rollin' themselves at me. Just a pair of eyes, Peter. Ah, he were a wonder, that little chap with grey whiskers. The way he went at that dear bull, a dabbin' at him here, and a dabbin' at him there, till he come to his tail. He'd done his tail last of all, Peter. Given a good tail, I says. Aye, that I will, says he, and a good stiff un, says I. You just keep your eye on it and watch, says he. Talk about tails, Peter. He put in that there tail so quick, nigh made me eyes water, and as for stiffness, well, look ye that. I'll tell ye that chap could paint a bull with his eyes shut. I had he could, and him such a very small man with grey whiskers. No, nope, you don't see many bulls like that in there, I'm thinking, Peter. They would be very hard to find, said I, and sighed again. Whereupon Silas sighed for company's sake, and nodding, went off about his many duties, whistling cheerily. So I presently turned about and crossed the road to the smithy, but upon the threshold I stopped all at once and drew softly back, for despite the early hour Prudence was there, upon her knees before the anvil, with George's great hand-hammer clasped to her bosom, sobbing over it, and while she sobbed she kissed its worn handle, and because such love was sacred and hallowed that dingy place, I took off my hat as I once more crossed the road. Seeing the bull was not yet astir, for the day was still young, as I say, I sat me down on the porch and sighed, and after I had sat there for some while, with my chin sunk upon my breast, plunged in bitter meditation, I became aware of the door opening, and the next moment a tremulous hand was upon my head, and looking round I beheld the ancient. Bless ye, Peter, bless ye, lad, and an old man's blessing be no light thing, specially such a old, old man as I be, and if it ain't as often as I feels in a blessing spirit, but, oh, Peter, twere me as found ye, weren't it? Why, to be sure it was, Ancient, very nearly five months ago. And I'll be all us ready with some news for ye, bain't I? Yes, indeed. Well, I got more news for ye, Peter, girt news. And what is it this time? I be all us full up a news, bain't I? He repeated. Yes, Ancient, said I, and sighed. And what is your news? Why, first of all, Peter, just reach me my snuff-box, will ye? Here it be, in my back eyed pocket. Thank ye, thank ye. Hereupon he knocked upon the lid with a bony knuckle. I do be that full o' news this marnin' that my innards be all of a quake, Peter, all of a quake, he nodded, saying which he sat down close beside me. Peter. Yes, ancient. Some day when dear old Dip will be all rusted away, and these old bones are restin' in the churchyard over to Cranbrook, Peter, you'll think, sometimes, of the very old man as was always so full o' news, won't we, Peter? Surely, ancient, I shall never forget you, said I, and sighed. And now, Peter, said the old man, extracting a pinch of snuff, now for your news, about Black Jarge it be. What of him, Ancient? The old man shook his head. It took eight on em to do it, Peter, and now four on em's layin' in their beds, and four on em's oblin' on crutches, and all over a couple of rabbits. Though dear be some fools who say it was partridges. Why, what do you mean? Why, you see, Peter, Black Jarge be such a girt strong man. I were much such another when I were young. Like, Lion in his wrathy be, ah, a bull bank, nothing to black charge. And the keepers come and found him under a tree, fast asleep, like David in the cave of Adullam, Peter, with a couple of rabbits he'd snared. And when they keepers tried to tack him, he rose up, he did, and throwed some on em this way and some on em that way, twere like Samson and the Philistines. 
If only he'd happened to find the jawbone of an ass lying handy, he'd a killed them all and got away, sure as sure. But it weren't to be, Peter. No, dead donkeys be scarce nowadays, and as for asses, jawbones, do you mean that George is taken prisoner? The ancient nodded and inhaled his pinch of snuff with much evident relish. It be girt news, bain't it, Peter? What have they done with him? Where is he, ancient? But before the old man could answer, Simon appeared. Oh, Peter, said he, shaking his head. The gaffer's been telling ye how they've took charge for poaching, I suppose. Simon, cried the ancient, shut thy mouth, lad, hold thy gab, and give thy poor old feather a chance. I be telling him so fast as I can. As I was a-saying, Peter, like a furish lion were jarge with the keepers, eight on em, Peter, like dogs a growling and growling and leaping and worrying all around him. Ah, like a lion he were. Waiting for a chance to use his right, do you see, Peter? added Simon. With his eyes a rolling and flaming, Peter, and his mane all bristling. Cool as any cucumber, Peter. A roaring and lashing of his tail. And sparring for an opening, Peter. And when he sees one, down in his mouth every time. Leaping in the air, rolling in the grass, with thy keepers clinging to him like leeches. Ah, leeches! And every time they rush, tap, but go his left, and bang, and go his right. And up he'd get like Samson again, Peter, and give himself a shake, bellering like a bull of Bashan. You see, they fought so close together that the keepers were as afeard to use their guns. Guns? Who's a talking of guns? Simon, me boy, you be all as a maggin and a maggin. Bridle thy tongue, lad. Bridle thy tongue afore it runs away wi' ye. All right, Holden, fire away. But at this juncture, old Amos hove in view, followed by the apologetic Dutton with Job and sundry others on their way to work. And as they came, they talked together with much solemn wagging of heads. Having reached the door of the bull, they paused and greeted us, and I thought old Amos's habitual grin seemed a trifle more pronounced than usual. "'So poor George has been gone and done for himself at last, eh? Oh, my soul, think of that now!' sighed old Amos. "'All as knowed he would,' added Job. "'Many's the time I've said he would, and you know it, all on ya.' "'It be the Barbadies or Australia,' grinned Amos. "'Transportation it'll be.' Oh, my soul, think of that now, and him a sissonerst man. And all along a couple of rabbits, said the ancient, emphasizing the last word with a loud rap on his snuff-box. Partridges, gaffer. They was partridges, returned old Amos. I always said his black charge had come to a bad end, reiterated Job. And what's more, he aren't got nobody to blame but hisself. And all for a couple of rabbits, sighed the ancient, staring old Amos full in the eye. Patridges, gaffer, they was patridges. You, James Dutton, was they patridges or was they not? Speak up, James. Hereupon the man Dutton, all perspiring apology, as usual, shuffled forward and mopping his reeking brow, delivered himself in this wise. Which I must say, meaning no offense to nobody, and if is so be apologizing, which I must say, me haven't seen em, they was, least a ways, he added as he met the ancient's piercing eye, least of ways they might have been, which, if they ain't, no matter. Having said which, he apologetically smeared his face all over with his shirt sleeve and subsided again. He do ring my heart eye, that it do, to think of poor George, a convict at Botany Bay, said old Amos, a working and digging and slaving with irons on his legs and arms, a jingling and a jangling when he walks. "'Well, but it's justice, aren't it?' demanded Job. "'A poacher's a thief, and a thief's a convict, or should be.' "'I've heard,' said old Amos, shaking his head. "'I've heard as they ties they convicts to posts, "'and lashes and lashes them with the cat nine tails.' "'They generally most deserves it,' nodded Job. "'But tis hard to think of poor George, "'tied up to one of them flogging posts with his back all raw and bleeding,' "'pursued old Amos.' Cruel are to be, and him such a fine strapping young chap. He were always a sight too fond of pitching into folk, George were, said Job. It'd be a mercy as my back weren't broke more'n once. Ah, nodded the ancient, you must be amazing strong in the back, Job. The way I've seen he come a rolling and a wallerin' out of that dear smithy's wonderful, wonderful, 
"'Lord Job, how you did roll!' "'Well, he won't never do it no more,' said Job, glowering. "'Well, with poachin' his game and knockin' his keepers about, "'tarn't likely a squire of Beverly'll let him off very easy.' "'Who?' said I, looking up and speaking for the first time. "'Squire Beverly, old burn em all. "'Sir Peregrine Beverly? Aye, for sure. "'And how far is it to Burnham Hall?' "'How fur? repeated Job, staring. "'Why, it lays to other side of Horse Maunden. "'It'll be a matter of eight miles, Peter,' said the ancient. Nine, Peter,' cried old Amos. Nine mile it be.' "'Though I won't swear, Peter,' continued the ancient, "'I won't swear as it aren't seven. "'Call it six and three-quarters,' said he, with his eagle eye on old Amos. "'Then I'd better start now,' said I, and rose. "'Why, Peter, where you be going?' "'To Burnham Hall, ancient.' "'What? You?' exclaimed Job. "'Do you think the squire'll see you?' "'I think so, yes.' "'Well, you won't. "'They'll never let the likes of you or me be on the gates.' "'That remains to be seen,' said I. "'So you am a-goin', are ye? "'I certainly am.' "'All right,' nodded Job. "'If they sets the dogs on you or chucks you into the road, "'don't go blaming it on me, that's all.' "'What, be really a-goin', Peter?' "'I really am, ancient. "'Then, by the Lord, I'll go with ya. "'It's a long walk. "'Nay, Simon shall drive us in the cart.' "'That I will,' nodded the innkeeper. "'Ay, lad,' cried the ancient, laying his hand upon my arm. "'We'll up and see, squire, you and me, shall us, Peter? "'There'll be some fuels,' said he, looking round upon the staring company. "'Some fuels as talk of Botany Bay and irons and whipping posts. "'All I say is, let em, Peter, let em. "'You and me'll up and see, squire, Peter, shan't us. "'Black jars aren't a convict yet. "'Let fuels say what they will. "'We'll show em, Peter, we'll show em. "'So saying, the old man led me into the kitchen of the bull, "'while Simon went to have the horses put to.' End of chapter 30 Concerning the Fate of Black George Section 37 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell Book 2, Chapter 31 In Which the Ancient is Surprised a cheery place, at all times, is the kitchen of an English inn, a comfortable place to eat in, to talk in, or to doze in, a place with which your parlors and with the drawing-rooms, your salons, a la the three Louis, with their irritating rococo, their gilt and satin and spindle-legged discomforts, are not, to my mind, worthy to compare. And what inn-kitchen in all broad England was ever brighter, neater, and more comfortable than this kitchen of the bull? where sweet Prue held supreme sway, with such grave dignity, and with her two white-capped maids to do her bidding and behests. Surely none. And surely in no inn, tavern, or hostelry soever, great or small, was there ever seen a daintier, prettier, sweeter hostess than this same Prue of ours. And her presence was reflected everywhere, and if ever the kitchen of an inn possessed a heart to lose then beyond all doubt this kitchen had lost its heart to prue long since even the battered cutlasses crossed upon the wall the ponderous jack above the hearth with its legend anno domini sixteen forty three took on a brighter sheen to greet her when she came and as for the pots and pans they fairly twinkled but to-day prue's eyes were red and her lips were all a-droop the which, though her smile was brave and ready, the ancient was quick to notice. "'Why, Prue, lass, you've been weeping. "'Yes, Granfer. "'Your pretty eyes be all swole, red they be. "'What's the trouble?' "'Oh, tis nothing, dear. "'Tis just a maid's foolishness. "'Never mind me, dear. "'Ah, but I love ye, Prue. "'Come, kiss me. "'There now, tell me all about it. "'All about it, Prue.' "'Oh, Granfer," said she, from the hollow of his shoulder, "'tis just Jarge. The old man grew very still. His mouth opened slowly and closed with a snap. "'Did he—did he say, Jarge, Prue? Is it breaking your art ye be for that dear poachin' black Jarge? To think as my Prue should come down to a poachin—' Prudence slipped from his encircling arm and stood up very straight and proud. There were tears thick upon her lashes, but she did not attempt to wipe them away. "'Granfer,' she said very gently, 
"'You mustn't speak of Jarge to me like that. "'You mustn't. "'You mustn't because I love him. "'And if he ever comes back, I'll marry him, "'if if he will only ask me. "'And if he never comes back, then I think I shall die.' The ancient took out his snuff-box, knocked it, opened it, glanced inside, and shut it up again. "'Did he tell me as you love Black Jarge, Prue?' "'Yes, Grandfer, I always have, and always shall.' "'Loves Black Jarge,' he repeated. "'Allus has, allus will. Oh, Lord, what have I done?' Now, very slowly, a tear crept down his wrinkled cheek, at sight of which Prue gave a little cry, and, kneeling beside his chair, took him in her arms. "'Oh, my lass, my little Prue, tis all my doin'. I thought—oh, Prue, twere me as parted you. I thought—the quivering voice broke off. "'Tis all right, Grandfer, never think of it. See there, I be smilin'. And she kissed him many times. "'A danged fool I be,' said the old man, shaking his head. "'No, no, Grandfer. "'That's what I be, Prue, a danged fool. "'If I do go afore that dear old rusty staple, "'twill serve me right. "'A danged fool I be. "'Allus loved him, allus will, and wishful to wed with him. "'Why, then,' said the ancient, swallowing two or three times, "'so he shall, my sweet.' So he shall, sure as sure. So come and kiss me, and forgive the old man as loves he so. What do we mean, Grandfer? said Prue between two kisses. A fine, strappin' chap be Jarge. After all, Peter, you been to patch on Jarge for looks, be you? No, indeed, ancient. Wishful to wed him she is, and so she shall. Lordy, Lord! Kiss me again, Prue, for I be goin' to see Squire. Ay, I be goin to up and speak with Squire for Jarge, and Peter be comin too. Oh, Mister Peter, faltered Prudence, be this true? And in her eyes was the light of a sudden hope. Yes, I nodded. Do you think Squire'll see you, listen to you? She cried breathlessly. I think he will, Prudence, said I. God bless you, Mister Peter, she murmured. God bless you. But now came the sound of wheels and the voice of Simon calling, wherefore I took my hat and followed the ancient to the door. But there Prudence stopped me. Last time you met with George, he tried to kill you. Oh, I know, and now you be going to— Nonsense, Prue, said I. But as I spoke, she stooped and would have kissed my hand, but I raised her and kissed her upon the cheek instead. "'For good luck, Prue,' said I, and so turned and left her. "'In the porch sat Job, with old Amos and the rest, "'still in solemn conclave over pipes and ale, "'who watched with gloomy brows as I swung myself up "'beside the ancient in the cart. "'A fool's journey,' remarked old Amos sententiously "'with a wave of his pipe. "'A fool's journey.' "'The ancient cast an observing eye up at the cloudless sky, "'and also nodded solemnly. There be some fools in this world, Peter, as mixes up rabbits with partridges, and honest men, like Jarge, with thieves, and lazy wagabones, like Job. But we'll show em, Peter, we'll show em, dang em. Drive on, Simon, my boy. So with this Parthian shot, feathered with the one strong word the ancient kept for such occasions, we drove away from the silenced group, who stared mutely after us until we were lost to view. But the last thing I saw was the light in Prue's sweet eyes as she watched us from the open lattice. Chapter 32 How We Set Out for Burnham Hall Peter, said the ancient, after we had gone a little way, Peter, I do opes as you aren't been and gone and rose my Prue's opes only to dash em down again. I can but do my best, ancient. Olden, said Simon, "'Twert Peter as rose her hopes. "'Twere you. "'Peter never said naught about bringing Jarge home. "'Simon,' commanded the ancient, "'hold thy tongue, lad. "'I says again, if Peter's been and rose Prue's opes only to dash em, "'twill be a bad day for Prue. "'You mark my words. 
Prue's a lass as don't love easy, and don't forget easy. Why, true, gaffer, true, God bless her. She'd be one as a'd pine, slow and quiet, like a flower in the woods or a leaf in autumn. Ah, fade she would, fade and fade. Well, she bain't a goin' to do no fadin', please the Lord. Not if me and Peter and you can help it, Simon, my boy. But we'm but poor worms, after all, as the Bible says. And if Peter has been in roser hopes of freein' Jarge, and don't free Jarge, if Jarge should have to go a convict to Australia, or to the other place, why then she'll fade, fade as ever was, and be laid in the churchyard afore her poor old grandfather. Lord, Olden, exclaimed Simon, who's a-talkin' of fadins in churchyards? I don't like it. Let's talk of summit else. Simon, said the ancient, shaking his head reprovingly, ye be a good boy. Ah, a steady, dutiful lad ye be, I don't deny it. But the Lord aren't give you no imagination, which, after all, you should be main thankful for. An imagination's a troublesome thing, aren't it, Peter? It is, said I, a damnable thing. Ay, many's the man as have been ruinated by his imagination. There was one, Nicodemus Blight were his name. And a very miserable cove he sounds, too, added Simon. But a very decent, civil-spoke, quiet young chap he were, continued the ancient. Only for his imagination, Lord. He were that full of imagination he couldn't drink his ale like an ordinary chap. Sip, he'd go, and sip, sip, till twere all gone. And then he'd forget as ever he'd add any, and go away without paying for it, if someone didn't remind him. "'You were no fool, Olden,' nodded Simon. "'And that weren't all, neither, not by no manner of means,' the ancient continued. "'I've knowed that there chap sit and listen to a pretty lass by the hour together, and never say a word, not one.' "'Didn't get a chance to, perhaps?' said Simon. "'It weren't that.' No, it were just his imagination a workin' and workin' inside of him and fillin' him up. Owls ever, at last, one day, he up and axed her to marry him, and she, bein' all took by surprise, said yes, and went and married someone else. Lord, said Simon, what did she go and marry another chap for? Simon, returned the ancient, don't go askin' foolish questions. Owls ever, she did and poor Nicodemus growed more imaginative than ever. After that, he took to turnips. "'Turnips!' exclaimed Simon, staring. "'Turnips, as ever was,' nodded the ancient. "'Used to stand for hours at a time a-looking at his turnips and shaking his head over em. "'But what for? A man must be a danged fool to go shaking of his head over a lot of turnips.' "'Well, I don't know,' rejoined the ancient. His turnips was very good uns as a rule, and fetched top prices in the markets. At this juncture there appeared a man in a cart ahead of us, who flourished his whip and roared a greeting, a coarse-visaged, loud-voiced fellow, whose beefy face was adorned with a pair of enormous fiery whiskers that seemed forever striving to hide his ears, which last, being very large and red, stood boldly out at right angles to his head, refusing to be thus ambushed and scorning all concealment. "'What? Be that the olden? Be you alive and kicking yet?' "'Aye, God be thanked, John.' "'And what be all this I ear about that dear black Jarge? He never were much good. But what be all this?' "'Lies, mostly, you may take your oath,' nodded the ancient. "'But he've been took for poaching, ah, and locked up at the all. "'And we'm going to fetch him. We be going to see Squire.' "'What? You, olden? You see, squire? Ha, ha, ha! "'Ah, me, and Peter, and Simon here. Why not?' "'You see his worship, Sir Peregrine, Beverly, Baronet, and Justice of the Peace? "'You? He cod, that's a good un. Danged if it ain't. "'And what might you be wishful to do when you see him? Which you won't? "'Fetch back George, of course.' Olden, you must be crazed in your head, and after George killing four keepers, Sir Peregrine's own keepers, too, shooting em stone dead, and three more a-dying. John, said the ancient, shaking his head, 
"'That's the worst of being cursed with ears like yourn.' "'My ears is all right,' returned John, frowning. "'Oh, ah,' chuckled the old man. "'Your ears is all right, John. "'Prize ears, you might call em. "'I never see ye to pair better growed. "'Never, no.' "'A bit large they may be,' growled John, "'giving a furtive pull to the nearest ambush. "'But large as ever was, John,' nodded the ancient. "'Uncommon large. "'And consequent they catches a lot too much.' I've kept my eye on them ears of yourn for thirty years and more, John. If so be as they grows any bigger, you'll be earin' things afore they're spoke, and— John gave a fierce tug to the ambush, muttered an oath, and lashing up his horse, disappeared down the road in a cloud of dust. "'Twere nigh on four year ago since Black Jarge thrashed John, weren't it, Simon? Ah, nodded Simon. "'John were in the ring then, Peter, and a pretty tough chap he were, too, "'though a bit too fond of swingin' with his right to please me. "'He were very sweet on Prue then, weren't he, Simon?' "'Ah,' nodded Simon again. "'He were always hangin' around the bull, till I warned him off.' "'And he laughed at he, Simon.' "'Ah, he did that, and I were goin' to have a go at him myself.' "'and the chances are he'd have beat me, "'seeing I hadn't been inside of a ring for ten year when... "'Up comes Jarge,' chuckled the ancient. "'What's all this?' say Jarge. "'I be going to teach John here to keep away from my prue,' says Simon. "'No, no,' says Jarge. "'John's young, and you beat the man you was ten years ago. "'Let me,' says Jarge. "'You,' says John, "'you get back to your bellers. "'You be pretty big, but I've beat the heads off better men nor you.' "'Why, then, have a try at mine,' says George, and with the word, bang, comes John's fist again his jaw, and they was at it. "'Oh, Peter, that were a fight. I seed a few in my time, but nothing like that air. "'And when t'were all over,' added Simon, "'Jarge went back to his ammer and bellers, and we picked John up, and I drove him home in this ere very cart, and nobody's cared to stand up to Jarge since.' "'You have both seen Black George fight, then?' I inquired. "'Many's the time, Peter.' "'And have you ever seen him knock down?' "'No,' returned the ancient, shaking his head. "'I've seen him all blood from head to foot, "'and once a girt big sailor-man knocked him sideways, "'after which George got up furious-like and put him to sleep. "'No, Peter,' added Simon. I don't think as there be a man in all England as could knock Black Jarge off his pins in a fair stand-up fight. Hm, said I. You see, he be that ard, Peter, nodded the ancient. Why, look, he cried, looky there. Now, looking where he pointed, I saw a man dart across the road some distance away. He was hidden almost immediately, for there were many trees thereabouts but there was no mistaking that length of limb and breadth of shoulder. "'Twere Black George's self!' exclaimed Simon, whipping up his horses. But when we reached the place, George was gone, and though we called and sought for some time, we saw him no more. So in a while we turned and jogged back toward Sissinghurst. "'What be you a-shaking your head over, Olden?' inquired Simon, after we had ridden some distance." I were wondering what that old fool Amos'll say when we drive back without Jarge. Being come to the parting of the ways, I descended from the cart, for my head was strangely heavy, and I felt much out of sorts. And though the day was still young, I had no mind for work. Therefore I bade adieu to Simon and the Ancient, and turned aside towards the hollow, leaving them staring after me in wonderment. End of Book Two, Chapter Thirty Two, read by Laurie Ann Walden. Section 38 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 33. In Which I Fall from Folly into Madness. It was with some little trepidation that I descended into the hollow and walked along beside the brook, for soon I should meet Charmian, and the memory of our parting, and the thought of this meeting, had been in my mind all day long. She would not be expecting me yet, for I was much before my usual time, wherefore I walked on slowly beside the brook, 
deliberating on what I should say to her, until I came to that large stone where I had sat dreaming the night when she had stood in the moonlight, and first bidden me in to supper. And now, sinking upon this stone, I set my elbows upon my knees and my chin in my hands, and fixing my eyes upon the ever-moving waters of the brook, fell into a profound meditation. From this I was suddenly aroused by the clink of iron and the snort of a horse. Wondering, I lifted my eyes, but the bushes were very dense and I could see nothing. But in a little, borne upon the gentle wind, came the sound of a voice, low and soft and very sweet, whose rich tones there was no mistaking followed almost immediately by another, deeper, gruffer, the voice of a man. With a bound I was upon my feet, and had somehow crossed the brook, but even so I was too late. There was the crack of a whip, followed by the muffled thud of a horse's hoofs, which died quickly away and was lost in the stir of leaves. I ground my teeth and cursed that fate which seemed determined that I should not meet this man face to face, this man whose back I had seen but once, a broad-shouldered back clad in a blue coat. I stood where I was, dumb and rigid, staring straight before me, and once again a tremor passed over me that came and went, growing stronger and stronger, and once again in my head was the thud, thud, thud of the hammer. In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a fair maid dwelling, made every youth cry well away. Her name was Barbara Allen. She was approaching by that leafy path that wound its way along beside the brook, and there came upon me a physical nausea, and ever the thud of the hammer grew more maddening. All in the merry month of May, when green buds they were swelling, young Jemmy Grove on his deathbed lay, for love of Barbara Allen. Now as she ended the verse she came out into the open and saw me, and seeing me, looked deliberately over my head and went on singing while I stood shivering. So slowly, slowly raised she up, and slowly she came nigh him, and when she drew the curtain by, young man, I think you're dying. And suddenly the trees and bushes swung giddily round, the grass swayed beneath my feet, and Charmian was beside me with her arm about my shoulders, but I pushed her from me and leaned against a tree nearby, and hearkened to the hammer in my brain. Why, Peter, said she, oh, Peter! "'Please, Charmian,' said I, speaking between the hammer strokes, "'do not touch me again. It is too soon after.' "'What do you mean, Peter? What do you mean? "'He has been with you again. "'What do you mean?' she cried. "'I know of his visits. "'If he was the same as last time in a blue coat. "'No, don't, don't touch me.' "'But she had sprung upon me and caught me by the arms "'and shook me in a grip so strong that, giddy as I was, "'I reeled and staggered like a drunken man.' and still her voice hissed, What do you mean? And her voice and hands and eyes were strangely compelling. I mean, I answered, in a low, even voice like one in a trance, that you are a Messalina, a Julia, a Joan of Naples, beautiful as they and as wanton. Now at the word she cried out and struck me twice across the face, blows that burnt and stung. Beast! she cried. Liar! Oh, that I had the strength to grind you into the earth beneath my foot! "'Oh, you poor, blind, self-deluding fool!' And she laughed, and her laughter stung me most of all. "'As I look at you,' she went on, the laugh still curling her lip, "'you stand there, what you are, a beaten hound. "'This is my last look, and I shall always remember you as I see you now, "'scarlet-cheeked, shame-faced, a beaten hound.' And speaking, she shook her hand at me and turned upon her heel. But with that word, and in that instant, the old, old demon leapt up within me, and as he leapt, I clasped my arms about her and caught her up and crushed her close and high against my breast. Go, said I. Go? No. No, not yet. And now, as her eyes met mine, I felt her tremble, yet she strove to hide her fear and heaped me with bitter scorn, but I only shook my head and smiled. And now she struggled to break my clasp, fiercely, desperately. Her long hair burst its fastenings and enveloped us both in its rippling splendor. She beat my face, she wound her fingers in my hair, but my lips smiled on, for the hammer in my brain had deadened all else. And presently she lay still. I felt her body relax and grow suddenly pliable and soft. Her head fell back across my arm, and as she lay, I saw the tears of her helplessness ooze out beneath her drooping lashes. But still I smiled. So, with her long hair trailing over me, I bore her to the cottage. Closing the door behind me with my foot, 
I crossed to the room and set her down upon the bed. She lay very still, but her bosom heaved tumultuously, and the tears still crept from beneath her lashes. But in a while she opened her eyes and looked at me, and shivered, and crouched farther from me among the pillows. Why did you lie to me, Charmian? Why did you lie to me? She did not answer, only she watched me as one might watch some relentless oncoming peril. I asked you once if you ever saw men hereabouts. When I was away, do you remember? You told me no, and while you spoke I knew you lied, for I had seen him standing among the leaves, waiting and watching for you. I once asked you if you were ever lonely when I was away, and you answered no. You were too busy, seldom went beyond the hollow, do you remember? And yet you had brought him here, here into the cottage. He had looked at my Virgil over your shoulder, do you remember? "'You played the spy,' she whispered with trembling lips, yet with eyes still fierce and scornful. "'You know I did not. Had I seen him, I should have killed him, because I loved you. I had set up an altar to you in my heart, where my soul might worship. Poor fool that I was! I loved you with every breath I drew. I think I must have shown you something of this from time to time, for you are very clever, and you may have laughed over it together, you and he.' And lately I have seen my altar foully desecrated, shattered, and utterly destroyed, and with it your sweet womanhood dragged in the mire, and yet I loved you still. Can you imagine, I wonder, the agony of it, the haunting horrors of imagination, the bitter days, the sleepless nights? To see you so beautiful, so glorious, and know you so base. Indeed, I think it came near driving me mad. It has sent me out into the night. I have held out my arms for the lightning to blast me. I have wished myself a thousand deaths. If Black George had but struck a little harder, or a little lighter. I am not the man I was before he thrashed me. My head grows confused and clouded at times. Would to God I were dead. But now you would go? Having killed my heart, broken my life, driven away all peace of mind, you would leave me. No, Charmian, I swear by God you shall not go yet a while. I have bought you very dear." bought you with my bitter agony, and by all the blasting torments I have suffered. Now as I ended she sprang from the bed and faced me, but meeting my look she shrank a little and drew her long hair about her like a mantle, then sought with trembling hands to hold me off. Peter, be sane! Oh, Peter, be merciful and let me go! Give me time, let me explain! My books, said I, have taught me that the more beautiful a woman's face, the more guileful is her heart, and your face is wonderfully beautiful, and as for your heart... You lied to me before. I... Oh, Peter, I am not the poor creature you think me. Were you the proudest lady in the land, you have deceived me and mocked me and lied to me. So saying, I reached out and seized her by each rounded arm and slowly drew her closer. And now she strove no more against me. Only in her face was bitter scorn and an anger that cast out fear. I hate you, despise you, she whispered. I hate you more than any man was ever hated. Inch by inch I drew her to me, until she stood close within the circle of my arms. And I think I love you more than any woman was ever loved, said I. For the glorious beauty of your strong, sweet body, for the temptation of your eyes, for the red lure of your lips. And so I stooped and kissed her full on the mouth. She lay soft and warm in my embrace, all unresisting, only she shivered beneath my kiss and a great sob rent her bosom. And I also think said I, that because of the perfidy of your heart I hate you as much as you do me, as much as ever woman, dead or living, was hated by man, and shall, forever. And while I spoke, I loosed her and turned, and strode swiftly out and away from the cottage. CHAPTER Thirty Four, IN WHICH I FIND PEACE AND JOY AND AN ABIDING SORROW I hurried on, looking neither to right nor left, seeing only the face of Charmian, now fearful and appealing, now blazing with scorn, and coming to the brook I sat down, and thought upon her marvellous beauty, of the firm roundness of the arms that my fingers had so lately pressed. Anon I started up again and plunged knee-deep through the brook, and strode on and on, bursting my way through bramble and briar, heedless of their petty stings, till at last I was clear of them, being now among trees. And here, where the shadow was deepest, I came upon a lurking figure, a figure I recognized, a figure there was no mistaking in which I should have known in a thousand. A shortish, broad-shouldered man, clad in a blue coat, who stood with his back towards me, looking down into the hollow, in the attitude of one who waits. For what? For whom? 
he was cut off from me by a solitary bush, a bramble that seemed to have strayed from its kind and lost itself, and running upon my toes I cleared this bush at a bound, and before the fellow had realized my presence I had pinned him by the collar. "'Damn you! Show your face!' I cried, and swung him round so fiercely that he staggered and his hat fell off. Then, as I saw, I clasped my head between my hands and fell back, staring. A grizzled man with an honest, open face, a middle-aged man whose homely features were lighted by a pair of kindly blue eyes, just now round with astonishment. "'Lord! Mr. Peter!' he exclaimed. "'Adam!' I groaned. "'Oh, God forgive me, it's Adam!' "'Lord, Mr. Peter,' said he again, "'you sure gave me a turn. "'What's the matter with you, sir? "'Come, Mr. Peter, never stare so wild-like. "'Come, sir, what is it? "'Tell me quick,' said I, catching his hand in mine. "'You have been here many times before of late. "'Why, yes, Mr. Peter, but quick,' said I, "'on one occasion she took you into the cottage yonder "'and showed you a book. "'You looked at it over her shoulder. "'Yes, sir, but what sort of book was it? "'An old book, sir, with the cover broken, "'with your name writ down inside of it.' "'Twas that way she found out who you was. "'Oh, Adam!' I cried. "'Oh, Adam, now may God help me!' "'And dropping his hand, I turned and ran until I reached the cottage. "'But it was empty. Charmian was gone. "'In a fever of haste I sought her along the brook, "'among the bushes and trees, even along the road. "'And as I sought, night fell, and in the shadows was black despair. "'I searched the hollow from end to end, calling upon her name, "'but no sound reached me save the hoot of an owl.' and the far-off, dismal cry of a corncrake. With some faint hope that she might have returned to the cottage, I hastened thither, but finding it dark and desolate, I gave way to my despair. Oh, blind, self-deceiving fool! She had said that, and she was right, as usual. She had called me an egoist. I was an egoist, a pedant, a blind, self-deceiving fool, who had willfully destroyed all hopes of a happiness, the very thought of which had so often set me trembling. And now she had left me, was gone. The world, my world, was a void. Its emptiness terrified me. How could I live without Charmian, the woman whose image was ever before my eyes, whose soft, low voice was ever in my ears? And I had thought so much to please her, I, who had set my thoughts to guard my tongue, lest by word or look I might offend her. And this was the end of it. Sitting down at the table, I leaned my head there, pressing my forehead against the hard wood, and remained thus a great while. At last, because it was very dark, I found and lighted a candle, and came and stood beside her bed. Very white and trim it looked, yet I was glad to see its smoothness rumpled where I had laid her down, and to see the depression in the pillow that her head had made. And while I stood there, up to me stole a perfume very faint, like the breath of violets in a wood at evening time, wherefore I sank down upon my knees beside the bed. And now the full knowledge of my madness rushed upon me in an overwhelming flood, but with misery was a great and mighty joy, for now I knew her worthy of all respect and honor and worship, for her intellect, for her proud virtue, for her spotless purity. And thus with joy came remorse, and with remorse an abiding sorrow. And gradually my arms crept about the pillow where her head had so often rested, wherefore I kissed it, and laid my head upon it, and sighed, and so fell into a troubled sleep. End of In Which I Find Peace and joy, and an abiding sorrow. Section 39 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnall. Chapter 35. How Black George Found Prudence in the Dawn. The chill of dawn was in the air when I awoke, and it was some few moments before, with a rush, I remembered why I was kneeling there beside Charmian's bed. Shivering, I rose and walked up and down to reduce the stiffness in my limbs. The fire was out, and I had no mind to light it, for I was in no mood to break my fast, though the necessary things stood ready, as her orderly hands had set them, and the plates and cups and saucers twinkled at me from the little cupboard I had made to hold them, a cupboard whose construction she had overlooked with a critical eye— and I must needs remember how she had insisted on being permitted to drive in three nails with her own hand. I could put my finger on those very nails, how she had tapped at those nails for fear of missing them, how beautiful she had looked in her coarse apron with her sleeves rolled up over her round white arms, how womanly and sweet, yet I had dared to think, had dared to call her a Messalina, 
Oh, that my tongue had withered, or ever I had coupled one so pure and noble with a creature so base and common. So thinking, I sighed and went out into the dawn. As I closed the door behind me, its hollow slam struck me sharply, and I called to mind how she had called it a bad and ill-fitting door. And indeed, so it was. With dejected step and hanging head, I made my way toward Sissinghurst, for since I was up, I might as well work, and there was much to be done. And as I went, I heard a distant clock chime four. Now when I reached the village, the sun was beginning to rise, and thus lifting up my eyes, I beheld one standing before the bull, a very tall man, much bigger and greater than most, a wild figure in the dawn, with matted hair and beard, clad in tattered clothes. Yet hair and beard gleamed a red gold where the light touched them, and there was but one man I knew so tall and so mighty as this. Wherefore I hurried toward him all unnoticed, for his eyes were raised to a certain latticed casement of the inn. And being come up, I reached out and touched this man upon the arm. George, said I, and held out my hand. He turned swiftly, but seeing me, started back a pace, staring. George, said I again, oh, George. But George only backed still further, passing his hand once or twice across his eyes. Peter, said he at last, speaking hardly above a whisper. But you am dead, Peter, dead. I killed thee. No, I answered, you didn't kill me. George, indeed, I wish you had. You came pretty near it, but you didn't quite manage it. And, George, I'm very desolate. Won't you shake hands with a desolate man? If you can, believing that I have always been your friend, and a true and loyal one, then give me your hand. If not, if you think me still the despicable traitor you once did, then let us go into the field yonder. And if you can manage to knock me on the head for good and all this time, why, so much the better. Come, what do you say? Without a word, Black George turned and led the way to a narrow lane a little distance beyond the bull, and from the lane into a meadow. Being come thither, I took off my coat and neckerchief, but this time I cast no look upon the world about me, and though indeed it was fair enough. But Black George stood half-turned from me, with his fists clenched and his broad shoulders heaving oddly. Peter, said he in his slow, heavy way, never clench your fist to me. I don't, I can't abide it. But, oh, man, Peter, how may I clasp hands with a chap as I've tried to kill? I can't do it, Peter, but don't, don't clench your fists agin me no more. I were jealous of you from the first, you see. You beat me at the hammer throwing, and she took your part agin me, and, and then you be so taken in your ways, and I be so big and clumsy, so very slow and heavy. There beat no chance betwixt us for a maid like Prue. She always was different from the likes of me. And any lass well, half an eye could see you as be a, a gentleman. Ah, and a good un, and so, Peter, and so. I be going away, a soldier, perhaps. I shan't love the dear lass quite so much after her a bit, perhaps. It won't be so sharp-like, arter a bit. But what's to be is to be. I've learned wisdom, and you and she was made for each other, and meant for each other from the first. So don't go to clench your fist again me no more, Peter. "'Never again, George,' said I. "'Unless,' he continued, as though struck by a bright idea, "'unless you are minded to have a whack at me. "'If so be, why, well, take it, Peter, and welcome. "'You see, I tried so hard to kill ee, "'so cruel hard, Peter, and I thought I had. "'I thought twere for that as they took me, "'and so I broke my way out of the lock-up "'and come to say good-bye to Prue's winder, "'and then I were going back to give myself up "'and let em hang me if they wanted to. "'Were you, George?' Yes. Here George turned to look at me, and looking, drooped his eyes, and fumbled with his hands, while up under his tanned skin there crept a painful burning crimson. Peter, said he, yes, George, I got some at more to tell ye, some it as I never meant to tell a soul, when you was down, lying at my feet. Yes, George. I, I kicked ye once. Did you, George? I, I were mad, mad with rage and bloodlust. Oh, man, Peter, I kicked ye. Veer said he, straightening his shoulders. Leastwise, I can look ye in the eye. Now that be off my mind. And now, if so be you am wishful to tack your whack at me, let it be a good un, Peter. No, I shall never raise my hand to you again, George. Tis likely you be thinking me a poor sort of man, arter what, what I just told ye. A coward? I think you're more of a man than ever, said I. Why, then, Peter, if you do that, Here's my hand, if you'll take it, I bid you good-bye. I'll take your hand, and gladly, George, but not to wish you good-bye. 
it shall be rather to bid you welcome home again. No, he cried, no, I couldn't. I couldn't abide to see you and Prue married, Peter. No, I couldn't abide it. And you never will, George. Prue loves a stronger, a better man than I, and she has wept over him, George, and prayed over him, such tears and prayers as surely might win the blackest soul to heaven, and has said that she would marry that man. Ah, even if he came back with fetter marks upon him, even then she would marry him if he would only ask her. Oh, Peter, cried George, seizing my shoulders in a mighty grip and looking into my eyes with tears in his own. Oh, man, Peter, you has knocked me down, and as I love for it, be this true? It is God's truth, said I, and look, there's a sign to prove I'm no liar. Look, and I pointed toward the bull. George turned, and I felt his fingers tighten suddenly, for there, in the open doorway of the inn, with the early glory of the morning all about her, stood Prue. As we watched, she began to cross the road toward the smithy, with laggard step and drooping head. "'Do you know where she's going, George? I can tell you. She's going to your smithy to pray for you. Do you hear? To pray for you. Come!' And I seized his arm. "'No, Peter, no. I durstn't. I couldn't.' But he suffered me to lead him forward nevertheless. Once he stopped and glanced round, but the village was asleep about us. So we presently came to the open door of the forge. And behold! Prue was kneeling before the anvil, with her face hidden in her arms and her slender body swaying slightly. But all at once, as if she felt him near her, she raised her head and saw him, and sprang to her feet with a glad cry. And as she stood, George went to her and knelt at her feet, and raising the hem of her gown, stooped and kissed it. "'Oh, my sweet maid,' said he, "'oh, my sweet Prue, I bain't worthy, I bain't but she caught the great shaggy head to her bosom and stifled it there. And in her face was a radiance, a happiness beyond words, and the man's strong arms clung close about her. So I turned and left them in paradise together. CHAPTER Thirty Six, WHICH SYMPATHIZES WITH A BRASS JACK, A BRACE OF CUTLASSES, AND DIVERSE POTS AND PANS. I found the ancient sunning himself in the porch before the inn as he waited for his breakfast. Peter, says he, I be turple cold sometimes. It comes a creepin' on me all at once, even if I'd be sittin' before a roarin' fire or a baskin' in this good warm sun. A cold as reaches down to me poor old art. Grave chills, I calls him, Peter. Ah, grave chills. Catches me by the art they do. You see, I be that old, Peter, that old and wore out. But you're a wonderful man for your age, said I, clasping the shriveled hand in mine, and very lusty and strong. "'So strong as a bull I be, Peter,' he nodded readily. "'But then even a bull gets old and wore out, "'and these grave chills catches me oftener and oftener. "'Tis like as if the angel of death reached out and touched me, "'just touched me with his finger soft-like as much to say, "'Ere be a poor old wore-out creeter, "'as I shall be wantin' soon. "'Well, I'll be ready. "'Tis only the young or the fool who fears to die. Three score years and ten, says the Bible, "'and I be years and years older than that.' Oh, I shan't be afeard to answer when I'm called, Peter. Here I be, Lord, I'll say. Here I be, thy poor old servant. But, oh, Peter, if I could be sure that dear roll rusty staple being took first, why, then I'd go joyful, joyful. But, why, there be that old fool Amos. Lord, what a daughter an old fool he be, and there be Job and Dutton. They be coming to plague me, Peter. I can feel it in me bones. Just reach me my snuff-box out of my iron pocket. "'and you shall see me smite the Amalekites hip and thigh.' "'Gaffer,' began old Amos, saluting with his usual grin as he came up, "'we be wishful to wax ye a question. "'We be wishful to know where be Black Jarge, "'which you haven't gone to fetch him, "'and bring him home again, them was you words.' "'Ah,' nodded Job, "'them was your very words. "'Bring him home again,' says you. "'But you didn't bring him home,' continued old Amos, "'leastwise not in the cart with you, Dutton here. "'James Dutton, see you come driving home.' "'But he didn't see no Jarge along with you. "'No, not so much as you could shake a stick at, you might say. "'Speak up, James Dutton, that you was a-leaning over your front gate "'as Gaffer came driving home, wasn't you? "'And you see Gaffer plain as plain, didn't you? "'Which me wisha no offence, and no one objectin' I did,' "'began the apology, perspiring profusely as usual. "'But I takes the liberty to say as it were a spade and not a gate, leastways. "'But you didn't see no sign of Jarge, did you?' "'demanded old Amos. "'As you might say, neither I nor heir of him. "'Speak up, James Dutton. "'Which, since you axes me, I make so bold as to answer, "'and very glad, I'm sure, no. "'Though as to I nor heir, 
I aren't wishing to swear to, may not be in near enough, which could only be expected, and very much obliged, I'm sure. You see, Gaffer, pursued Amos, if you didn't bring Jarge back with you, which you said you would, the question we axes is, where be Jarge? Ah, where, nodded Joe gloomily. Here the ancient was evidently at a loss, to cover which he took a vast pinch of snuff. I'll be we know as he bean't pining away in a dungeon cell, irons on his legs, strapped in a straight jacket, and old Amos stopped, open mouthed and staring, for out from the gloom of the smithy issued Black Jarge himself, with Prue upon his arm. The ancient stared also, but dissembling his vast surprise, he dealt the lid of his snuff box two loud triumphant knocks. Peter, said he, rising stiffly, Peter, lad, I were beginning to think as Jarge were never coming in to breakfast at all. I've waited and waited till I be so ravenous as a lion and tiger. But here he be at last, Peter, here he be. So let's go in and eat summit. Saying which, he turned his back upon his discomfited tormentors, and led me into the kitchen of the inn. And there were the white-capped maids, setting forth such a breakfast as only such a kitchen could produce. And presently there was Prue herself, with George hanging back, something shamefaced, till the ancient had hobbled forward to give him welcome. And there was honest Simon, all wonderment and hearty greeting. And last, but by no means least, there were the battered cutlasses, the brass jack, and the glittering pots and pans, glittering and gleaming and twinkling a greeting likewise, and with all their might. Ah! But they little guessed why Prue's eyes were so shy and sweet, or why the color came and went in her pretty cheeks. Little they guessed why this gold-haired giant trod so lightly, and held his tall head so very high. Little they dreamed of the situation as yet. Had they done so, surely they must, one and all, have fallen upon that curly golden head, and buried it beneath their gleaming, glittering, twinkling jealousy. And what a meal was that! With those deft, white-capped maids, to wait upon our wants, and with prudence hovering here and there to see that all were duly served, and refusing to sit down until George's great arm, a very gentle arm for one so strong and big, drew her down beside him. Guess truly what a meal that was, and how the ancient chuckled and dug me with one bony elbow, and George with the other, and chuckled again till he choked and choked, till he gasped and gasped, till he had us all on our feet, and then demanded indignantly why we couldn't let him enjoy himself in peace. And now, when the meal was nearly over, he suddenly took it into his head that Prue didn't love George as she should, and as he deserved to be, and nothing would content him but that she must kiss him then and there. And not on the forehead, mind, nor on the cheek, but on the place as God made for it, the mouth, my lass. And now, who so shy and blushing as Prue, and who so nervous for her sake as Black George, very evidently clasping her hand under the table, and bidding her never mind, as he was content and never to put herself out over such as him. Whereupon Mistress Prue must needs turn, and taking his head between her hands, kissed him, not once or twice, but three times, and upon the place God made for it, the mouth. O oh, gleaming cutlasses, O oh, great brass jack and glittering pots and pans, can ye any longer gleam and glitter and twinkle in doubt? Alas, I trow not, Therefore it is only natural and to be expected that beneath your outward polish lurk black and bitter feelings against this curly-headed giant, and a bloodthirsty desire for vengeance. If so, then one and all of you have, at least, the good feeling not to show it, a behavior worthy of gentlemen. What do I say? Of gentlemen? Fie! Rather let it be said, of pots and pans. End of which sympathizes with a brass jack, a brace of cutlasses, and diverse pots and pans. Section 40 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnall. Chapter 37. The Preacher. It is a wise, and to some extent a true saying, that hard work is an antidote to sorrow, a panacea for all trouble. But when the labor is over and done, when the tools are set by, and the weary worker goes forth into the quiet evening, how then? For we cannot always work, and sooner or later comes the still hour when memory rushes in upon us again, and sorrow and remorse sit dark and gloomy on either hand. A week dragged by, a season of alternate hope and black despair, a restless fever of nights and days, for with each dawn came hope that lived a while beside me, only to fly away with the sun and leave me to despair. I hungered for the sound of Charmian's voice, 
for the quick light fall of her foot, for the least touch of her hand. I became more and more possessed of a morbid fancy that she might be existing nearby, could I but find her, that she had passed along the road only a little while before me, or at this very moment might be approaching, might be within sight, were I but quick enough. Often at such times I would fling down my hammer or tongs, to George's surprise, and hurry to the door, stare up and down the road, or pause in my hammer strokes, fiercely bidding George to do the same, fancying I heard her voice calling to me from a distance. And George would watch me with a troubled brow, but with rare delicacy, said no word. Indeed, the thought of Charmian was with me everywhere. The ringing hammers mocked me with her praises, the bellows sang of her beauty, the trees whispered Charmian, Charmian, and Charmian was in the very air. But when I had reluctantly bidden George good night and set out along the lanes full of the fragrant dusk of evening, when, reaching the hollow, I followed that leafy path beside the brook which she and I had so often trodden together, when I sat in my gloomy disordered cottage with the deep silence unbroken save for the plaintive murmur of the brook, then indeed my loneliness was well nigh more than I could bear. There were dark hours when the cottage rang with strange sounds, when I would lie face down upon the floor, clutching my throbbing temples between my palms, fearful of myself and dreading the oncoming horror of madness. It was at this time, too, that I began to be haunted by the thing above the door, the rusty staple upon which a man had choked out his wretched life sixty and six years ago, a wanderer, a lonely man, perhaps acquainted with misery or haunted by remorse, one who had suffered much and long, even as I, but who had eventually escaped it all, even as I might do. Thus I would sit, chin in hand, staring up at this staple until the light failed, and sometimes in the dead of night I would steal softly there to touch it with my finger. Looking back on all this, it seems that I came very near to losing my reason, for I had then by no means recovered from Black George's fist, and indeed, even now, I am at times not wholly free from its effect. My sleep, too, was often broken and troubled with wild dreams, so that bed became a place of horror, and, rising, I would sit before the empty hearth, a candle guttering at my elbow, and think of Charmian, until I would fancy I heard the rustle of her garments behind me, and start up, trembling and breathless. At such times the tap of a blown leaf against the lattice would fill me with a fever of hope and expectation. Often and often her soft laugh stole to me in the gurgle of the brook, and she would call to me in the deep night silences, in a voice very sweet and faint and far away. Then I would plunge out into the dark and lift my hands to the stars that winked upon my agony and journey on through a desolate world to return with the dawn, weary and despondent. It was after one of these wild night expeditions that I sat beneath a tree watching the sunrise, and yet I think I must have dozed, for I was startled by a voice close above me, and glancing up I recognized the little preacher. As our eyes met he immediately took the pipe from his lips and made as though to cram it into his pocket. Though indeed it is empty, he explained as though I had spoken, old habits cling to one, young sir, and my pipe here has been the friend of my solitude these many years. I cannot bear to turn my back upon it yet so I carry it with me still, and sometimes, when at all thoughtful, I find it between my lips. But though the flesh, as you see, is very weak, I hope in time to forego even this. And he sighed, shaking his head in gentle deprecation of himself. But you look pale. Haggard, he went on. You are ill, young sir. No, no, said I, springing to my feet. Look at this arm. Is it the arm of a sick man? No, no, I am well enough. But what of him we found in the ditch, you and I? the miserable creature who lay bubbling in the grass. He has been very near death, sir. Indeed, his days are numbered, I think. Yet he is better for the time being, and last night declared his intention of leaving the shelter of my humble roof and setting forth upon his mission. His mission, sir? He speaks of himself as one chosen by God to work his will, and asks but to live until this mission, whatever it is, be accomplished. A strange being, said the little preacher, puffing at his empty pipe again as we walked on side by side. A dark, incomprehensible man, and a very, very wretched one, poor soul. Wretched, said I, is that not our human lot? Man is born to sorrow as the sparks fly upward, and Job was accounted wise in his generation. That was a cry from the depths of despond, but Job stood at last upon the heights, and felt once more God's blessed Son, and rejoiced, even as we should. 
but as regards this stranger he is one who would seem to have suffered some great wrong the continued thought of which has unhinged his mind his heart seems broken dead i have sitting beside his delirious couch heard him babble a terrible indictment against some man i have also heard him pray and his prayers have been all for vengeance poor fellow said i it were better we had left him to die in his ditch for if death does not bring oblivion it may bring a change of scene sir said the preacher laying his hand upon my arm such bitterness in one so young is unnatural you are in some trouble i would that i might aid you be your friend know you better oh sir that is easily done i am a blacksmith hard-working sober and useful to my fellows they call me peter smith a certain time since i was a useless dreamer spending more money in a week than i now earn in a year and getting very little for it i was studious egotistical and pedantic wasting my time upon impossible translations that nobody wanted and they knew me as peter vibart vibart exclaimed the preacher starting and looking up at me vibart i nodded related in any way to sir maurice vibart his cousin sir my companion appeared lost in thought for he was puffing at his empty pipe again do you happen to know sir maurice i inquired no returned the preacher no sir but i have heard mention of him and lately though just when or where i cannot for the life of me recall why the name is familiar to a great many people said i you see he is rather a famous character in his way talking thus we presently reached a stile beyond which the footpath led away through swaying corn and by shady hop garden to sissinghurst village here the preacher stopped and gave me his hand but i noticed he still puffed at his pipe and you are now a blacksmith and mightily content so to be you are a most strange young man said the preacher shaking his head many people have told me the same sir said i and vaulted over the stile yet turning back when i had gone some way i saw him leaning where i had left him and with his pipe still in his mouth. End of The Preacher Section 41 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 38 In Which I Meet My Cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart as i approached the smithy late though the hour was and george made it a rule to have the fire going by six every morning no sound of hammer reached me and coming into the place i found it empty that i remembered that to-day george was to drive over to tonbridge with prudence and the ancient to invest in certain household necessities for in a month's time they were to be married hereupon i must needs contrast george's happy future with my dreary one and fall bitterly to cursing myself and sitting on the ancient's stool in the corner i covered my face and my thoughts were very black now presently as i sat thus i became conscious of a very delicate perfume in the air and also that some one had entered quietly my breath caught in my throat but i did not at once look up fearing to dispel the hope that tingled within me so i remained with my face still covered until something touched me and i saw that it was the gold-mounted handle of a whip wherefore i raised my head suddenly and glanced up then I beheld a radiant vision in polished riding-boots and speckless moleskins, in handsome flowered waistcoat and perfect-fitting coat, with snowy frills at throat and wrists, a tall gallant figure of a graceful, easy bearing, who stood, a picture of cool gentlemanly insolence, tapping his boot lightly with his whip. But as his eye met mine, the tapping whip grew suddenly still. His languid expression vanished and he came a quick step nearer and bent his face nearer my own, a dark face, handsome in its way, pale and aquiline with a powerful jaw, and dominating eyes and mouth, a face, nay, a mask, rather, that smiled and smiled, but never showed the man beneath. Now glancing up at his brow I saw there a small, newly healed scar. "'Is it possible?' said he, speaking in that softly modulated voice I remembered to have heard once before. Can it be possible that I address my worthy cousin? That shirt, that utterly impossible coat and belcher, and yet the likeness is remarkable. Have I the honor to address Mr. Peter Vibart, late of Oxford? The same, sir, I answered, rising. Then, most worthy cousin, I salute you, and he removed his hat, bowing with an ironic grace. 
Believe me, I have frequently desired to see that paragon of all the virtues, whose dutiful respect a revered uncle rewarded with the proverbial shilling. Egad, he went on, examining me through his glass with a great show of interest, had you been any other than the same virtuous cousin Peter, whose graces and perfections were forever being thrown at my head, I could have sympathized with you positively, if only on account of that most obnoxious coat and belcher, and the grime and sootiness of things in general. Poof! he exclaimed, pressing his perfumed handkerchief to his nostrils. Thuh! How damnably sulphur and brimstony you do keep yourself, cousin! Oh, gad! You would certainly find it much clearer outside, said I, beginning to blow up the fire. But then, cousin Peter, outside one must become a target for the yokel eye, and I detest being stared at by the uneducated, who naturally lack appreciation. On the whole I prefer the smoke, though it chokes one most infernally. Where may one venture to sit here? I tendered him the stool, but he shook his head, and crossing to the anvil, flicked it daintily with his handkerchief, and sat down, dangling his leg. "'Pon my soul,' said he, eyeing me languidly through his glass again, "'pon my soul, you are damnably like me, you know, in features. "'Damnably,' I nodded. He glanced at me sharply and laughed. "'My man, a creature of the name of Parks,' said he, swinging his spurred boot to and fro, "'led me to suppose that I should meet a person here, a blacksmith fellow.' "'Your man, Parks, informed you correctly,' I nodded. "'What can I do for you?' "'The devil!' exclaimed Sir Maurice, shaking his head. "'But no, you are, as I gather, somewhat eccentric. "'But even you would never take such a desperate step as to—' "'To—' "'Become a blacksmith fellow?' I put in. "'Precisely!' "'Alas, Sir Maurice, I blush to say that rather than become an unprincipled adventurer, "'living on my wits, or a mean-spirited hanger-on, "'fawning upon acquaintances for a livelihood—' or doing anything rather than soil my hands with honest toil, I became a blacksmith fellow some four or five months ago. Really, it is most distressing to observe to what depths virtue may drag a man. You are a very monster of probity and rectitude, exclaimed Sir Maurice. Indeed, I am astonished. You manifest not only shocking bad judgment, but a most deplorable lack of thought. Virtue is damnably selfish as a rule. Really! It is quite disconcerting to find oneself first cousin to a blacksmith. Fellow, I added. Fellow, nodded Sir Maurice. Oh, the devil! To think of my worthy cousin reduced to the necessity of laboring with hammer and saw. Not a saw, I put in. We will say chisel, then. A vibart with a hammer and chisel. Deuce take me! Most distressing. And you will pardon my saying so. You do not seem to thrive on hammers and chisels. No one could say you looked blooming, or even flourishing, like the young bay tree, which is, I fancy, an eastern expression. Sir, said I, may I remind you that I have work to do? A deuced interesting place, though, this, he smiled, staring round imperturbably through his glass. So, er, so devilishly grimy and smutty and gritty. Quite a number of horseshoes, too. Do you know, cousin, I've never before remarked what a number of holes there are in a horseshoe but live and learn. Here he paused to inhale a pinch of snuff, very daintily, from a jeweled box. It is a strange thing, he pursued, as he dusted his fingers on his handkerchief, a very strange thing, that being cousins, we have never met till now, especially as I have heard so very much about you. Pray, said I, pray, how should you hear about one so very insignificant as myself? Oh, I have heard of good Cousin Peter since I was an imp of a boy, he smiled. Cousin Peter was my chart whereby to steer through the shoals of boyish mischief into the haven of our Uncle George's good graces. Oh, I have heard over much of you, cousin, from dear, kind, well-meaning relatives and friends, damn them. They rang your praises in my ears morning, noon, and night. And why? Simply that I might come to surpass you in virtue, learning, wit, and appearance, and so win our Uncle George's regard and, incidentally, his legacy. But I was a young demon, romping with the grooms in the stable, while you were a young angel in Nankin's, passing studious hours with your books. When I was a scapegrace of Harrow, you were winning gold opinions at Eton. When you were honors man at Oxford, I was rusticating at Cambridge. Naturally enough, perhaps I grew sick of the name Peter, and indeed it smacks damnably of fish, don't you think? You, 
or your name, crossed me at every turn. If it wasn't for Cousin Peter, I was heir to ten thousand a year. But good Cousin Peter was so fond of Uncle George, and Uncle George was so fond of good Cousin Peter, that Maurice might go hang for a graceless dog and be damned to him. You have my deepest sympathy and apologies, said I. Still, I have sometimes been curious to meet worthy Cousin Peter, and it's rather surprising that I've never done so. On the contrary, I began, but his laugh stopped me. Ah, to be sure, he nodded, our ways have lain widely separated hitherto. You, a scholar, treading the difficult path of learning, I, oh, egad, a terrible fellow, a mauvais sujet, a sad dog. But after all, cousin, when one comes to look at you to-day, you might stand for a terrible example of virtue run riot, a distressing spectacle of dutiful respect and good precedent cut off without shilling. Really, it is horrifying to observe to what depths virtue may plunge an otherwise well-balanced individual. Little dreamed those dear, kind, well-meaning relatives and friends, damn them, that while the willful Maurice lived on, continually getting into hot water and out again, up to his eyes in debt, and pretty well esteemed, the virtuous pattern Peter would descend to a hammer and saw, I should say chisel, in a very grimy place, where he is, it seems, the presiding genius. Indeed, this first meeting of ours under these circumstances is somewhat dramatic, as it should be. And yet we have met before, said I, and the circumstances were then even more dramatic, perhaps. We met in a tempest, sir. Ha! he exclaimed, dwelling on the word and speaking very slowly. A tempest, cousin. There was much wind and rain, and it was very dark. Dark, cousin? But I saw your face very plainly as you lay on your back, sir, by the aid of a postilion's lanthorn. It was greatly struck by our mutual resemblance. Sir Maurice raised his glass and looked at me, and as he looked, smiled, but he could not hide the sudden passionate quiver of his thin nostrils, or the gleam of the eyes beneath their languid lids. He rose slowly and paced to the door. When he came back again he was laughing softly, but still he could not hide the quiver of his nostrils, or the gleam of the eyes beneath their languid lids. So it was you, he murmured, with a pause between the words. Oh, was ever so damnably contrary, to think that I should hunt her into your very arms, to think that of all men in the world it should be you to play the squire of dames. And he laughed again, but as he did so, the stout riding whip snapped in his hands like a straw. He glanced down at the broken pieces, and then from them to me. You see, I'm rather strong in the hands, cousin, said he, shaking his head, but I was not quite strong enough last time we met though to be sure, as you say, it was very dark. Had I known it was worthy Cousin Peter's throat I grasped, I think I might have squeezed just a little tighter. Sir, said I, shaking my head, I really don't think you could have done it. Yes, he sighed, tossing his broken whip into a corner. Yes, I think so. You see, I mistook you for merely an interfering country bumpkin. Yes, I nodded while I, on the other hand, took you for a fine gentleman, nobly intent on the ruin of an unfortunate, friendless girl, whose poverty would seem to make her an easy victim, in which it appears you were as much mistaken as I, Cousin Peter. Here he glanced at me with a sudden keenness. Indeed. Why, surely, said he, surely you must know. He paused to flick a speck of soot from his knee and then continued. Did she tell you nothing of herself? Very little beside her name. "'Ah, she told you her name, then?' "'Yes, she told me her name. "'Well, cousin?' "'Well, sir?' "'We had both risen, and now fronted each other across the anvil, "'Sir Maurice, debonair and smiling, while I stood frowning and gloomy. "'Come,' said I at last, "'let us understand each other once for all. "'You tell me that you have always looked upon me as your rival for our uncle's good graces. "'I never was. "'You have deceived yourself into believing that because I was his ward, "'and that alone augmented my chances of becoming the heir.' It never did. He saw me as seldom as possible, and if he ever troubled his head about either of us, it would have seemed that he favored you. I tell you, I never was your rival in the past, and never shall be in the future. Meaning, cousin? Meaning, sir, in regard to either the legacy or the Lady Sophia Sefton. I was never fond enough of money to marry for it. I have never seen this lady, nor do I propose to thus. So as far as I'm concerned, you are free to win her and the fortune as soon as you will. I, as you see, prefer horseshoes. And what, said Sir Maurice, flicking a speck of soot from his cuff, and immediately looking me again, what of Charmian? I don't know, I answered, 
nor should I be likely to tell you, if I did. Wherever she may be, she is safe, I trust, beyond your reach. No, he broke in, she will never be beyond my reach until she is dead, or I am. Perhaps not even then, and I shall find her again, sooner or later, depend upon it. Yes, you may depend upon that. Cousin Maurice, said I, reaching out my hand to him, wherever she may be, she is alone and unprotected. Pursue her no farther. Go back to London, marry your Lady Sefton, inherit your fortune, but leave Charmian Brown in peace. And pray, said he, frowning suddenly, whence this solicitude de on her behalf? What is she to you, this Charmian Brown? Nothing, I answered hurriedly. Nothing at all. God knows, nor ever can be. Sir Maurice suddenly leaned forward, and catching me by the shoulder, peered into my face. By heaven, he exclaimed, the fellow actually loves her. Well, said I, meeting his look, why not? Yes, I love her. A very fury of rage seemed suddenly to possess him. The languid, smiling gentleman became a devil with vicious eyes and evil, snarling mouth, whose fingers sank into my flesh as he swung me back and forth in a powerful grip. "'You love her? You? You?' he panted. "'Yes,' I answered, flinging him off so that he staggered. "'Yes, yes, I, who fought for her once and am willing, most willing, to do so again, now or at any other time. For though I hold no hope of winning her, ever, yet I can serve her still, and protect her from the pollution of your presence.' And I clenched my fists. He stood poised as though about to spring at me, and I saw his knuckles gleam whiter than the laces above them. But all at once he laughed lightly, easily as ever. "'A very perfect, gentle knight,' he murmured, sans peur et sans reproche, though somewhat grimy and in a leather apron, chivalry kneeling amid hammers and horseshoes, worshipping her with a reverence distant and lowly. "'How like you, worthy cousin! How very like you, and how very affecting! But,' and here his nostrils quivered again, but I tell you, she is mine, mine, and always has been, and no man living shall come between us. No, by God! That, said I, that remains to be seen. Ha! Though indeed I think she is safe from you while I live. But then, cousin Peter, life is a very uncertain thing. At best, he returned, glancing at me beneath his drooping lids. Yes, I nodded. It is sometimes a blessing to remember that. Sir Maurice strolled to the door and being there, paused, and looked back over his shoulder. "'I go to find Charmian,' said he, "'and I shall find her, sooner or later, and when I do, should you take it upon yourself to come between us again, or presume to interfere again, I shall kill you, worthy cousin, without the least compunction. If you think this sufficient warning, act upon it. If not,' he shrugged his shoulders significantly, "'farewell, good and worthy cousin, Peter, farewell.' Or shall we say au revoir? End of In Which I Meet My Cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart Section 42 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Ellen Preckle The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell Chapter 39. How I Went Down Into the Shadows Peter, said George one evening, turning to me with troubled look I'd seen so often on his face of late, what be wrong with you, my chap? You be growing paler every day. Oh, Peter, you be like a man as is dying by inches, if tis any o' my doing. Nonsense, George, I broke in, with sudden asperity. I am well enough. Yet I've seen your hands fall a-trembling sometimes, Peter, all at once. "'And you missed your stroke yesterday. Come square down on the anvil. You can't have forgot.' "'I remember,' I muttered. "'I remember. And twice again to-day. And you be silent, Peter, and don't seem to hear when spoken to, and short in your temper. Oh, you beant the man you was. I've seen it a-coming on you more and more. Oh, man, Peter,' he cried, turning his back on me suddenly. "'You as I'd let walk over me. You as I'd be cut in pieces for. If it be me as done it. No, no, George, it wasn't you. Of course not. If I'm a little strange, it's probably due to lack of sleep, nothing more. You see, Peter, I tried so hard to kill ye, and you said yourself as I come nigh doing it. But then you didn't quite manage it, I cried harshly. Would to God you had. As it is, I'm alive, and there's an end of it. Twere a woundy blow I give you the last one. I never forget the look on your face as you went down. Oh, Peter, you've never been the same since. It be all my doing. I know it, I know it. 
and sinking upon the ancient's stool in the corner, Black George covered his face. "'Never think of it, George,' I said, laying my arm across his heaving shoulders. "'That's all over and done with, dear fellow, and I would not have it otherwise, since it gained me your friendship. I am all right, well and strong. It's only sleep that I need, George, only sleep.' Upon the still evening air rose the sharp tap-tap of the ancient stick, whereat up started the smith, and coming to the forge began raking out the fire with great dust and clatter, as the old man hobbled up, saluting us cheerily as he came. "'Lord!' he exclaimed, pausing in the doorway to lean upon his stick, and glance from one to the other of us with his quick, bright eyes. "'Lord, there be two other such fine, upstanding, lively-looking chaps in all the South Country, as you two chaps be. No, nor such smiths. It do warm my old heart to look at ye. Puts me in a mind o' what I were myself ages and ages ago. I weren't quite so tall as George, perhaps, by about, say, a half inch. But then I were wider, wider, a uh, sight wider in the shoulder, and so strong as four bulls, and with eyes big and sharp and piercing like Peter's. Only Peter's bean't quite so sharp, no, nor yet so piercing, and that minds me as I've got news for ye, Peter. What news? said I, turning. Surprising news it be, ah, and astonishing too. But first of all, Peter, I wants to ax ye a question. What is it, ancient? Why, it be this, Peter, said the old man, hobbling nearer and peering up into my face. Ever since the time as I went and found ye, I've thought as there was somewhat strange about ye, what with your soft voice and gentle ways, and it came to me all at once, about three o'clock this afternoon, as you might be a duke, in disguise, Peter. "'Yes or nay, Peter?' and he fixed me with his eye. "'No, ancient,' I answered, smiling. "'I am no duke.' "'Ah, well, an earl, then.' "'Nor an earl.' "'A baronet, perhaps.' "'No, not even a baronet.' "'Ah,' said the old man, eyeing me doubtfully, "'I've often thought as you might be one or to others, "'of them especially since about three o'clock this afternoon. "'Why so?' Well, "'That's the point. "'That's the very news I got to tell ye,' "'chuckled the ancient as he seated himself in the corner.' "'You must know, then,' he began, with an impressive rap on the lid of his snuff-box, "'about three o'clock, sartre noon, I was sitting on the stile by Simon's five-acre field, "'when along the road comes a lady, handsome and proud-looking, and as fine as fine could be, a riding of a horse, "'and with a servant riding another horse behind her. "'As she comes up, she gives me a look, out o'er her eyes, soft they was, and dark, and up I gets to touch me at. All at once she smiles at me, and her smile were as sweet and gentle as her eyes, and she pulls up her horse. Why, you must be the ancient, says she. Why, so Peter calls me, my lady, says I. And now is Peter, she says. Quick like, how is Peter, says she. Fine and hearty, says I. Eats well, sleeps sound, says I. His arms is strong, his legs is strong, and he ain't afeard of nobody, like a young lion be Peter, says I. Now, while I'm a-saying this, she looks at me, soft and thoughtful-like, and takes out a little book, and begins to write in it, a-wrinkling her pretty black brows over it, and shaking her head to herself. Presently, she tears out what she's been a-writing, and gives it to me. "'Will you give this to Peter for me?' says she. "'That I will, my lady,' says I. "'Thank ye,' says she, smiling again, and holding out her white hand to me, which I kisses. "'Indeed,' says she, "'I understand now why Peter's so fond of you. I think I could be very fond of you, too.' says she. And so she turns her horse, and the servant he turns his, and off they go. And here, Peter, here be the letter. Saying which, the ancient took a slip of paper from the cavernous interior of his hat, and tendered it to me. With my head in a whirl, I crossed to the door and leaned there a while, staring sightlessly out into the summer evening, for it seemed that in this little slip of paper lay that which meant life or death to me. So for a long minute I leaned there, fearing to learn my fate, then I opened the little folded square of paper, and holding it before my eyes, read, Charmian Brown presents, this scratched out, While you busied yourself forging horseshoes, your cousin Sir Maurice sought and found me. I do not love him, but Charmian. Farewell. This also scored out. Again I stared before me with unseeing eyes, but my hands no longer trembled, nor did I fear any more. The prisoner had received his sentence, and suspense was at an end. And all at once I laughed, and tore the paper across, and laughed and laughed till George and the Ancient came to stare at me. "'Don't he?' cried the old man. "'Don't he, Peter? You be like a corp laughing, don't he?' But the laugh still shook me, while I tore and tore at the paper, and so let the pieces drop and flutter from my fingers. "'There,' said I, "'there goes a fool's dream. 
See how it scatters a little here, a little there. So long as this world lasts, these pieces shall never come together again. So saying, I set off along the road, looking neither to right nor left. But when I had gone some distance, I found that George walked beside me, and he was very silent as he walked, and I saw the trouble was back in his eyes again. George, said I, stopping, why do you follow me? I don't follow you, Peter, he answered. I be only wishful to walk with you a ways. I'm in no mood for company, George. Well, I beant company, Peter. Your friend I be, he said doggedly, and without looking at me. Yes, said I. Yes, my good and trusty friend. Peter, he cried suddenly, laying his hand upon my shoulder, don't go back to that dear ghastly holler tonight. It's the only place in the world for me tonight, George. And so we went on again, side by side, through the evening, and spoke no more until we had come to the parting of the ways. Down in the hollow the shadows lay black and heavy, and I saw George shiver as he looked. "'Good-bye,' said I, clasping his hand. "'Good-bye, George. "'Why do we say good-bye?' "'Because I'm going away.' "'Going away, Peter, but where?' "'God knows,' I answered. "'But wherever it be, I shall carry with me the memory of your kind, true heart. "'And you, I think, will remember me. "'It is a blessed thing, George, to know that how so far we go— a friend's kind thoughts journey on with us, untiring to the end. Oh, Peter, man, don't go for to leave me. To part is our human lot, George, and as well now as later. Goodbye. No, no, he cried, throwing his arm about me. Not down there. It be so deadly and lonely down there in the darkness. Come back with me, just for tonight. But I broke from his detaining hand and plunged on down into the shadows. And presently, turning my head, I saw him yet standing where I had left him, looming gigantic upon the sky behind, and with his head sunk upon his breast. Being now come at last to the cottage, I paused, and from that place of shadows I lifted my gaze to the luminous heaven, where were a myriad eyes that seemed to watch me with a new meaning to-night, wherefore I entered the cottage hastily, and closing the door, barred it behind me. Then I turned to peer up at that which showed above the door, the rusty staple upon which a man had choked his life out sixty and six years ago and I began very slowly to loosen the belcher neckerchief about my throat. Peter! cried a voice. Peter! and a hand was beating upon the door. Chapter 40 How in place of death I found the fullness of life. She came in swiftly, closing the door behind her, found and lighted a candle, and setting it upon the table between us, put back the hood of her cloak and looked at me, while I stood mute before her, abashed by the accusation of her eyes. Coward! she said and with the word snatched the neckerchief from my grasp, and casting it upon the floor, set her foot upon it. Coward! said she again. Yes, I muttered. Yes, I was lost, in a great darkness and full of horror of coming rites and days, and so I would have run away from it all, like a coward. Oh, hateful, hateful! she cried, and covered her face as from some horror. Indeed, you cannot despise me more than I do myself, said I, now or ever. I am a failure in all things, except perhaps the making of horseshoes, and this world has no place for failures. And as for horseshoes, fool, she whispered, oh fool that I dreamed so wise, oh coward that seemed so brave and strong, oh man that was so gloriously young and unspoiled, that it should end here, that it should come to this. And though she kept her face hidden, I knew that she was weeping. A woman's love transforms the man till she sees him, not as he is, but as her heart would have him be. The dross becomes pure gold, and she believes, and believes, until one day her heart breaks. Charmian, what, what do you mean? Oh, are you still so blind? Must I tell you? She cried, lifting her head proudly. Why did I live beside you here in the wilderness? Why did I work for you, contrive for you, and seek to make this desolation a home for you? Often my heart cried out its secret to you, but you never heard. Often it trembled in my voice, looked at you from my eyes, but you never guessed. Oh, blind, blind, and you drove me from you with shameful words, but, oh, I came back to you, and now I know you, for but common clay after all, and even yet, she stopped suddenly and once more hid her face from me in her hands, and even yet, Charmian, I whispered. Very still she stood, with her face bowed upon her hands, but she could not hide from me the swift rise and fall of her bosom. Speak, oh, Charmian, speak. I am so weak, so weak, she whispered. I hate myself. Charmian, I cried. Oh, Charmian, and seized her hands. Despite her resistance, drew her into my arms, and clasping her close, forced her to look at me. And even yet, what more? 
What more, tell me? But lying back across my arm, she held me off with both hands. Don't, she cried. Don't, you shame me. Let me go. God knows I am all unworthy, Charmian, and so low in my abasement that to touch you is presumption. But, oh, woman whom I have loved from the first, and shall to the end, have you stooped in your infinite mercy to lift me from these depths? Is it a new life you offer me? Was it for this you came to-night? Let me go. Oh, Peter, let me go. Why? Why did you come? Loose me. Why did you come? To meet Sir Maurice Vibart. To meet Sir Maurice, I repeated dully. Sir Maurice? And at that moment she broke from me, and stood with her head thrown back, and her eyes very bright as though defying me. But I remained where I was, my arms hanging. He was to meet me here at nine o'clock. Oh, Charmian, I whispered, are all women so cruel as you, I wonder? And turning my back upon her, I leaned above the mantel, staring down at the long dead ashes on the hearth. But, standing there, I heard a footstep outside, and swung round with clenched fists. Yet Charmian was quicker, and as the door opened and Sir Maurice entered, she was between us. He stood upon the threshold, dazzled a little by the light, but smiling, graceful, debonair, and point of ice as ever. Indeed, his very presence seemed to make the mean room the meaner by contrast, and as he bent to kiss her hand, I became acutely conscious of my own rough person, my worn and shabby clothes, and of my hands, coarsened and grimed by labor, wherefore my frown grew the blacker, and I clenched my fists the tighter. "'I lost my way, Charmian,' he began, but, though late, I am none the less welcome, I trust. Ah, you frown, Cousin Peter. Quite a ghoulish spot, this, at night. You probably find it most congenial, good Cousin Timon of Athens. Indeed, Cousin, you are very like Timon of Athens.' And he laughed, so that I, finding my pipe upon the mantel-shelf, began to turn it aimlessly round and round in my twitching fingers. "'You have already met, then?' inquired Charmian, glancing from one to the other of us. "'We had that mutual pleasure nearly a week ago,' nodded Sir Maurice, "'when we agreed to disagree, as we always have done and shall do, with the result that we find each other agreeably disagreeable. I had hoped that you might be friends. My dear Charmian, I wonder at you,' he sighed, "'so unreasonable. Would you have us contravene the established order of things?' It was preordained that Cousin Peter should scowl at me, precisely as he is doing, and that I should shrug my shoulders thus at Cousin Peter, a little hate with, say, a dash of contempt, give a zest to that dish of conglomerate vapidity which we call life, and make it almost palatable. But I'm not here on Cousin Peter's account, he went on, drawing a step nearer to her. At this moment I heartily wish him, among his hammers and chisels, I have come for you, Charmian, because I love you. I have sought you patiently until I found you, and I will never forego you as long as life lasts. But you know all this. Yes, I know all this. I have been very patient, Charmian, submitting to your whims and fancies, but through it all I knew, and in your woman's heart you knew, that you must yield at last, that the chase must end. Some day, well, let it be to-night. My chaise is waiting. When I ran away from you in the storm, Sir Maurice, I told you once and for all that I hated you. Have you forgotten? Hated you, always and ever, and tried to kill you. Oh, Charmian, I have known such hate transfigured into love before now, such love as is only worth the winning. And you are mine, you always were, from the first moment that our eyes met. Come, my chaise is waiting. In a few hours we can be in London, or Dover. No, never. Never is a long time, Charmian, but I am at your service. What is your will? I shall remain here. Here, in the wilderness, with my husband. Your husband? I am going to marry your cousin, Peter Vibart. The pipe slipped from my fingers and shivered to pieces on the floor, and in that same fraction of time Sir Maurice had turned and leapt toward me. But as he came I struck him twice, with left and right, and he staggered backward to the wall. He stood for a moment with his head stooped upon his hands. When he looked up, his face was dead white, and with a smear of blood upon it that seemed to accentuate its pallor, but his voice came smooth and unruffled as ever. "'The mind feminine is given to change,' said he softly, and I shall return. "'Yes, I shall come back. Smile, madam, triumph, cousin, but I shall come between you yet. I tell you I'll come between you, living or dead.' And so he turned and was gone into the shadows. But as for me, I sat down, and leaning my chin in my hand, stared down at the broken fragments of my pipe. "'Peter, you are safe now,' said I, without looking up. "'He is gone. But 
Oh, Charmian, was there no other way? She was down beside me on her knees, had taken my hand, rough and grimy as it was, and pressed it to her lips, and so had drawn it about her neck, holding it there, and with her face hidden in my breast. Oh, strong man that is so weak, she whispered. Oh, grave philosopher that is so foolish. Oh, lonely boy that is so helpless. Oh, Peter Vibart, my Peter. Charmian, said I, trembling, what does it mean? It means, Peter. Yes, that the humble person. Yes, will marry you whenever you will. If, yes, if you will only ask her. End of How in Place of Death I Found the Fullness of Life Section 43 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle The Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnall Chapter 41 Light and Shadow now, as the little preacher closed his book, the sun rose up, filling the world about us with his glory. And looking into the eyes of my wife, it seemed that a veil was lifted for a moment there, and I read that which her lips might never tell, and there also were joy and shame and a deep happiness. See, said the little preacher, smiling upon us, it is day, and a very glorious one. Already a thousand little choristers of God's great cathedral have begun to chant your marriage hymn. Go forth together, man and wife, upon this great wide road that we call life. Go forth together, made strong in faith, and brave with hope, and the memory of him who walked these ways before you, who joyed and sorrowed and suffered and endured all things, even as we must. Go forth together, and may his blessing abide with you, and the peace that passeth understanding. And so we turned together side by side, and left him standing amid his roses. Silently we went together homeward, through the dewy morning, with a soft green carpet underfoot, and leafy arches overhead, where trees bent to whisper benedictions, and shook down jewels from their dewy leaves upon us as we passed, by merry brooks that laughed and chattered, and gurgled of love and happiness, while over all rose the swelling chorus of the birds. Surely never had they piped so gladly in this glad world before, not even for the gentle Spencer, though he says— there was none of them that feigned to sing, for each of them he pained, to find out merry crafty notes. They ne spared not their throats. And being come at length to the hollow, Charmian must needs pause beside the pool among the willows to view herself in the pellicid water. And on this mirror our eyes met, and lo, of a sudden her lashes drooped, and she turned her head aside. Don't, Peter, she whispered, don't look at me so. How may I help it when you are so beautiful? and because of my eyes she would have fled from me, but I caught her in my arms, and there amid the leaves, despite the jealous babble of the brook, for the second time in my life her lips met mine. And gazing yet into her eye, I told her how, in this shady bower, I had once watched her weaving leaves into her hair, and heard her talk to her reflection, and so had stolen away for fear of her beauty. Fear, Peter? We were so far out of the world, and I longed to kiss you, and didn't, Peter and didn't, Charmian, because we were so very far from the world, and because you were so very much alone, and and because, Peter, because you are a gentle man and strong, as the old locket says, and you do remember, she went on hurriedly, laying her cool restraining fingers on my eager lips, how I found you wearing that locket, and how you blundered and stammered over it and pretended to read your Homer, and how you sang to prevent me, and how gravely you reproved me, and how you called me a creature, and how you deserved it, sir, and grew more helpless and ill at ease than ever, and how, just to flatter my vanity, you told me I had glorious hair. And so you have, said I, kissing a curl at her temple. When you unbind it, my Charmian, it will cover you like a mantle. Now when I said this, for some reason she glanced up at me sudden and shy, and blushed and slipped from my arms and fled up the path like a nymph. So we presently entered the cottage, flushed and panting and laughing for sheer happiness, and now she rolled up her sleeves and set about preparing breakfast, laughing my assistance to scorn, but growing mightily indignant when I would kiss her, yet blushing and yielding nevertheless. And while she bustled to and fro, keeping well out of reach of my arm, she began to sing in her soft voice to herself, In Scarlet Town, where I was born, there was a fair maid dwelling, made every youth 
cry well away. Her name was Barbara Allen. Oh, Charmian, how wonderful you are! All in the merry month of May, when green buds they were swellin'. Surely no woman ever had such beautiful arms, so round and soft and white, Charmian. She turned upon me with a fork held up admonishingly, but meeting my look, her eyes wavered, and up from throat to brow rushed a wave of burning crimson. Oh, Peter, you make me almost afraid of you, she whispered, and hid her face against my shoulder. Are you content to have married such a very poor man, to be the wife of a village blacksmith? Why, Peter, in all the world there never was such another blacksmith as mine, and— and there the kettle is boiling over let it said i and the bacon the bacon will burn let me go and oh peter so in due time we sat down to our solitary wedding breakfast and there were no eyes to speculate upon the bride's beauty to note her changing colour or the glory of her eyes and no healths were proposed or toasts drunk nor any speeches spoken except perhaps by my good friend the brook outside who of course understood the situation and babbled tolerantly of us to the listening trees, like the grim old philosopher he was. In this solitude we were surely closer together and belonged more fully to each other, for all her looks and thoughts were mine, as mine were hers. And as we ate, sometimes talking and sometimes laughing, though rarely, one seldom laughs in the wilderness, our hands would stray to meet each other across the table, and I would answer I, while in the silence the brook would lift its voice to chuckle throaty chuckles and outlandish witticisms, such as could only be expected from an old reprobate who had grown so in years, and had seen so very much of life. At such times Charmian's cheeks would flush and her lashes droop, as though, indeed, she were versed in the language of brooks. So the golden hours slipped by, the sun crept westward, and evening stole upon us. "'This is a very rough place for you,' said I, and sighed. We were sitting on the bench before the door, and Charmian had laid her folded hands upon my shoulder, and her chin upon her hands and now she echoed my sigh, but answered without stirring. It's the dearest place in all the world. And very lonely, I pursued. I shall be busy all day long, Peter, and you always reach home as evening falls, and then, then, oh, I shan't be lonely. But I am such a gloomy fellow at the best of times, and very clumsy, Charmian, and something of a failure. And my husband. Peter, Peter, oh, Peter, I started and rose to my feet. Peter, oh, Peter, called the voice again seemingly from the road, and now I thought it sounded familiar. Charmian stole her arms about my neck. I think it is Simon, said I uneasily. What can have brought him? And he will never venture down into the hollow on account of the ghost. I must go and see what he wants. Yes, Peter, she murmured, but the clasp of her arms tightened. What is it? said I, looking into her troubled eyes. Charmian, you are trembling. What is it? I don't know. But, oh, Peter, I feel as if a shadow, a black and awful shadow, were creeping upon us, hiding us from each other. I am very foolish, aren't I? And this our wedding day. Peter! Peter! Come with me, Charmy, and let us go together. No, I must wait. It is a woman's destiny to wait. But I am brave again. Go, see what is wanted. I found Simon, sure enough, in the lane, seated in his cart, and his face looked squarer and grimmer even than usual. Oh, Peter, said he, gripping my hand, it be come at last. Gaffer be goin'. Going, Simon? Dyin', Peter. "'Fell downstairs a mornin'. "'Doctor says he can't last the day out. "'Sinkin' fast he be, and he acts in free, Peter. "'Where be Peter?' says he, over and over again. "'Where be the Peter as I found of a sunshiny afternoon "'down in the audit aller? "'You weren't at work's mornin', Peter. "'So I be come to fetch ye. "'You'll come back me to bid good-bye to the old man?' "'Yes, I'll come, Simon,' I answered. "'Wait here for me.' "'Charmian was waiting for me in the cottage, "'and as she looked up at me I saw the trouble was back in her eyes again. "'You must—' go leave me she inquired for a little while yes i felt it she said with a pitiful little smile the ancient is dying said i now as i spoke my eyes encountered the staple above the door wherefore mounting him on a chair i seized and shook it and lo the rusty iron snapped off in my fingers like glass and i slipped it into my pocket oh peter don't go don't leave me cried charmian suddenly and i saw her face was very pale and she trembled charmian said i and sprang to her side Oh, my love, what is it? It is as though the shadow hung over us, darker and more threatening, Peter, as if our happiness were at an end. I seem to hear Maurice's threat, to come between us, living or dead. I'm afraid, she whispered, clinging to me. I am afraid. 
but all at once she was calm again and full of self-reproaches, calling herself weak and foolish and hysterical, though indeed I was never hysterical before, and telling me that I must go, that it was my duty to go to the gentle dying old man, urging me to the door, almost eagerly, till being out of the cottage she must needs fall a-trembling once more, and wind her arms about my neck with a great sob. But, oh, you will come back soon, very soon, Peter, and we know that nothing can ever come between us again, never again, my husband. And with that blessed word she drew me down to her lips, and turning, fled into the cottage. I went on slowly up the path to meet Simon, and as I went my heart was heavy, and my mind full of a strange foreboding. But I never thought of the omen of the knife that had once fallen, and quivered in the floor between us. "'Twears the snuff-box has done it,' said Simon, staring very hard at his horse's ears as we jogged along the road. "'He were a-goin' upstairs for it, and slipped, he did. Simon says he, as I lifted of him in my arms, Simon says he, quiet-like, I be done for at last, lad. This poor old feather o' yourn will never go a-climbin' up these stairs ni mer, says he. Never, no, mer. After this, Simon fell silent, and I likewise, until we reached the village. Before the bull was a group who talked with hushed voices and grave faces. Even old Amos grinned no more. The old man lay in his great four-poster bed, propped up with pillows, and with Prue beside him to smooth his silver hair with tender fingers, and Black George towering in the shade of the bed-curtains like a grieving giant. "'Here I be, Peter,' said the old man, beckoning me feebly with his hand. "'Here I be, at the parting of the ways, and with some had a gone wrong with my innards. When a man gets old as I be, his innards be like glass, Peter like glass, and apt to fly all to pieces if he goes a-slippin' and sliding down the stairs like me.' "'Are you in pain?' I asked, clasping his shriveled hand. "'Just a twinge now and then, Peter, but, Lord, that ain't nothing to a man the likes of me, Peter.' "'You always were so hale and hearty,' I nodded, giving him the usual opening that he had waited for. "'Aye, so strong as a bull that I were, like a lion in me youth. Black jarge were nought to me. A cart-horse I were.' "'Yes,' said I. "'Yes,' and stooped my head lower over the feeble old hand. "'But after all, Peter, bulls pass away, and lions and cart-horses lose their teeth, and gets wore out. For all the flesh is grass, but iron is iron, bain't it, Peter? Rusts it do, but is iron all the same, and lasts a man out.' "'even such hardy chap as I were. "'Sometimes,' I said, without looking up. "'I be very old and tired, Peter. "'My heart be all wore out with beatin' and beatin' all these years. "'Tis a wonder as it didn't stop afore now, but... "'A staple, Peter, don't have no heart to go a-beatin' and a-wearin' of itself away. "'No, ancient. "'So here be I, a-standin' in the valley of shadow, "'and waitin' for God's angel to take me hand, for to show me the way. "'Tis a darksome road, Peter, but I be not afeard, "'and there be a light beyond Jordan water.' No, I aren't afeard to meet God has made me, for the Lord is merciful and very kind, and I don't suppose he'll be very hard on an old, old man as did his best, and would a hard all tired and wore away with beaten. I be ready, Peter, only... Yes, ancient. Oh, Peter, it be that there old staple, as it'll go rustin' away and rustin' away arter the old man has watched, so as laid in the earth and forgot about. No, said I, without looking up, but slipping my hand into my pocket. No, ancient. Peter, oh, Peter, do we mean? I mean that although it had no heart, the staple was tired and worn out, just as you are. So I brought it to you. And I slipped the rusty bit of iron into the old man's trembling palm. Oh, Lord, he began in a fervent voice. Oh, dear Lord, I got it, Lord. The old staple. I be ready to come to thee, and joyful, joyful, and for this mercy and benefit received. Blessed be thy name. Amen. He lay very quiet for a while with the broken staple clasped to his breast, and his eyes closed. "'Peter,' said he suddenly, "'you won't have no one to bring you news no more. Why, Peter, be a crying for me? "'Tis true, twere me found ye, but I didn't think as you'd go to cry tears for me. "'I be going to take old staple with me, Peter, all along the road, and Peter—' "'Yes, ancient, be ye quite sure as ye aren't a duke?' "'Quite sure.' "'Nor nor?' "'No, ancient. Not even a baronet?' No, ancient. Ah, oh, well, you be a man, Peter, and tis summit to have found a man, that it be. And now he feebly beckoned us all nearer. Children, said he, I be an old and ancient man. I be a-goin' across the river to wait for you, my blessin' on you. It be a dark, dark road, but I've got to old staple, and there be a light beyond the river. So the ancient sighed and crossed the dark river into the land of the light eternal. End of Light and Shadow
Section 44 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 42. How Sir Maurice Kept His Word. Night, with a rising moon, and over all things a great quietude, a deep, deep silence air close and heavy without a breath to wake the slumbering trees an oppressive stillness which small sounds magnified themselves and seemed disproportionately loud and presently as i went upon my way i forgot the old man sleeping so peacefully with the rusty staple clasped to his shrunken breast and thought only of the proud woman who had given her life into my keeping and who henceforth would walk with me hand in hand upon this broad highway over rough places and smooth, even unto the end. So I strode on, full of a deep and abiding joy, and with heart that throbbed and hands that trembled, because I knew that she watched and waited for my coming. A sound broke upon the stillness, sudden and sharp, like the snapping of a stick. I stopped and glanced about me, but it had come and gone, lost in the all-pervading calm. And presently, reaching the leafy path, that led steeply down into the hollow, I paused a moment to look about me, and to listen again. But the deep silence was all unbroken, save for the slumberous song of the brook, that stole up to me from the shadows, and I wondered idly what that sudden sound might have been. So I began to descend this leafy path, and went on to meet that which lay waiting for me in the shadows. It was dark here among the trees, for the moon was low as yet, but every now and then she sent a kindly ray through some opening amid the leaves, so that as I descended the path I seemed to be wading through small, limpid pools of radiance. But all at once I stopped, staring at something which lay at the edge of one of those pools, a white claw, a hand, whose fingers, talon-like, had sunk deep and embedded themselves in the turf. And beyond this gleaming hand was an arm, and beyond that again, something that bulked across my path, darker than the shadows. Running forward, I stood looking down at that which lay at my feet, so very still, and stooped suddenly, and turned it over that I might see the face, and seeing it, started back in shuddering horror, for in those features, hideous with blood, stained and blackened with powder, I recognized my cousin, Sir Maurice Vibart. Then, remembering the stick that had snapped, I wondered no more, but a sudden deadly faintness came upon me, so that I leaned weakly against a tree near by. A rustling of leaves, a shuddering of breath, and though I did not raise my head, I knew that Charmian was there. "'Oh, Peter!' she whispered. "'Oh, Peter!' And that was all. But moved by something in her tone, I glanced up. Her eyes were wide and staring, not at me, but at that which lay between us. Her face was pallid, even her lips had lost their color, and she clasped one hand upon her bosom. The other was hidden in the folds of her gown." hidden as I remembered to have seen it once before, but now it struck me with a horrible significance. Wherefore I reached out and caught that hidden hand, and drew the weapon from her nerveless fingers, holding it where the light could play upon it. She started, shivered violently, and covered her eyes, while I, looking down at the pistol in my hand, saw that it had lately been discharged. "'He has kept his word,' she whispered. "'He has kept his word.' "'Yes, Charmian, he has kept his word.' "'Oh, Peter!' she moaned, and stretched out her hand toward me, yet she kept her face turned from that which lay across the path between us, and her hands were shaking pitifully. "'Peter!' she cried, with a sudden break in her voice, but I went on wiping the soot from the pistol barrel with the end of my neckerchief. Then, all at once, she was beside me, clasping my arm, and she was pleading with me, her words coming in a flood. "'No, Peter, no! Oh, God, you do not think it! You can't! You mustn't! I was alone!' waiting for you, and the hours passed, and you didn't come, and I was nervous and frightened and full of awful fancies. I thought I heard someone creeping around the cottage. Once I thought someone peered in at the lattice, and once I thought someone tried the door. And so, because I was frightened, Peter, I took that, that, and held it in my hand. And while I sat there, it seemed more than ever that someone was breathing softly outside the door— and so, Peter, I couldn't bear it any more, and opened the lattice and fired, in the air, I swear it was in the air, and I stood there at the open casement, sick with fear, and trying to pray for you, because I knew he had come back to kill you, Peter. And while I prayed, I heard another shot, not close but faint, like the snapping of a twig, Peter, and I ran out, and, 
Oh, Peter, that is all. But you believe, oh, you believe, don't you, Peter? While she spoke, I had slipped the pistol into my pocket, and now I held out my hands to her and drew her near, and gazed into the troubled depths of her eyes. Charmian, said I, Charmian, I love you, and God forbid I should ever doubt you any more. So, with a sigh, she sank in my embrace, her arms crept about my neck, and our lips met and clung together. But even then, while I looked upon her beauty, while the contact of her lips thrilled through me, even then, in my mind, I saw the murderous pistol in her hand, as I had seen it months ago. Indeed, it almost seemed that she divined my thoughts, for she drew swiftly back and looked at me with haggard eyes. Peter, she whispered, what is it? What is it? Oh, Charmian, said I over and over again, I love you. I love you. And I kissed her appealing eyes, and stayed her questioning lips with my kisses. I love you more than my life, more than honor, more than my soul. And because I so love you, to-night you must leave me. Leave you? Ah, no, Peter, no. No, I am your wife. I must stay with you. To suffer and share your troubles and dangers, it is my right, my privilege. Let us go away together, now, anywhere, anywhere, only let us be together, my husband. Don't, I cried, don't. Do you think it is so easy to remain here without you, to lose you so soon, so very soon? If I only loved you a little less. Ah, don't you see, before this week is out, my description will be all over England. We should be caught, and you would have to stand beside me in a court of justice, and face the shame of it. Dear love, it would be my pride, my pride, Peter, to face them all, to clasp this dear hand in mine. Never, I cried, clenching my fists, never. You must leave me. No one must know Charmian Brown ever existed. You must go. Hush, she whispered, clasping me tighter. Listen, someone is coming. Away to the right we could hear the leaves rustling, as though a strong wind passed through them. A light flickered and went out, flickered again, and a voice hailed faintly, Hello! Come, said Charmian, clasping my hand. Let us go and meet him. No, Charmian, no, I must see this man alone. You must leave here to-night, now. You can catch the London mail at the crossroads. Go to Blackheath, to Sir Richard Anstruther. He is my friend. Tell him everything. She was down at my feet and had caught my hand to her bosom. I can't, she cried. I can't go and leave you here alone. I have loved you so, from the very first. It seems that each day my love has grown until it is a part of me. Oh, Peter, don't send me away from you. It will kill me, I think. Better that than the shame of prison, I exclaimed and while I spoke I lifted her in my arms. Oh, I am proud, proud to have won such a love as yours. Let me try to be worthy of it. Good-bye, my beloved. And so I kissed her and would have turned away, but her arms clung about me. Oh, Peter, she sobbed, if you must go, if you will go, call me your wife, just once, Peter. The hovering light was much nearer now, and the rustle of leaves louder, as I stooped above her cold hands and kissed their trembling fingers. Some day, said I, some day, if there is a just God in heaven, we shall meet again, perhaps soon, perhaps late. Until then, let us dream of that glorious golden some day, but now, farewell, O beloved wife. With a broken cry, she drew my head down upon her breast and clasped it there, while her tears mingled with her kisses, and so, crying my name, she turned and was lost among the leaves. Chapter 43 How I Set Out to Face My Destiny the pallid moon shone down pitilessly upon the dead white face that stared up at me through its grime and blood, with the same half-tolerant, half-amused contempt of me that it had worn in life. The drawn lips seemed to mock me, and the clenched fists to defy me still, so that I shivered and turned to watch the oncoming light that danced like a will-o'-the-wisp among the shadows. Presently it stopped, and a voice hailed once more. Hello! Hello! I called back. This way! This way! In a little while I saw the figure of a man, whom I at once recognized as the one-time postillion, bearing the lanthorn of a chaise, and as he approached it struck me that this meeting was very much like our first, save for him who lay in the shadows, staring up at me with unwinking eyes. "'So ho!' exclaimed the postillion as he came up, raising his lanthorn that he may view me better. "'It is you again, is it?' "'Yes,' I nodded. "'Well, I don't like it,' he grumbled. A meeting of each other again like this, in this here ghastly place? No, I don't like it. Too much like the last time to be natural. And as you know, I can't bide on naturalness. If I was to ax you where my master was, like as not you'd tell me he was... Here, said I, and moving aside, pointed to the shadow. 
The postilion stepped nearer, lowering his lantern, and staggered blindly backward. Lord, he whimpered, Lord, love me, and stood staring with a dropped jaw. Where is your chaise? Up yonder, yonder in the lane, he mumbled, his eyes still fixed. Then help me to carry him there. No, no, I durn't to touch it, I, I cannot, not me, not me. I think you will, said I, and took the pistol from my pocket. Ain't one enough for to-night, he muttered. Put it away, I'll come. I'll do it. Put it away. So I dropped the weapon back into my pocket, while the postilion, shivering violently, stooped with me above the inanimate figure, and with our limp burden between us, we staggered and stumbled up the path and along the lane to where stood a light travelling chaise. He ain't likely to come to this time, I'm thinking, said the postilion, mopping the sweat from his brow and grinning with pallid lips after we'd got our burden into the vehicle. No, he ain't likely to wake up no more, nor yet curse my head off this side of Jordan. No, I answered, beginning to unwind my neckcloth. Nor it ain't no good to go abandoning and binding him up like you did last time. No, I said, no. And stepping into the chaise, I muffled that disfigured face in my neckcloth. Having done which, I closed the door. What now? inquired the postilion. Now you can drive us to Cranbrook. What, be you a-coming too? Yes, I nodded. Yes, I am coming too. Lord love me, he exclaimed. And a moment later I heard him chirruping to his horses. The whip cracked and the chaise lurched forward. Whether he had some wild notion that I might attempt to descend and make my escape before we reached our destination, I cannot say. But he drove at a furious pace, taking corners at reckless speed, so the chaise lurched and swayed most violently, and more than once I was compelled to hold that awful figure down upon the seat before me, lest it should slide to the floor. On we sped, past hedge and tree, by field and lonely wood, and ever in my ears was the whir of the wheels, the drumming of hooves, and the crack of the whip, and ever the flitting moonbeams danced across that muffled face until it seemed that the features writhed and jibed at me beneath the folds of the neckerchief. And so at last came lights and houses, and the sound of excited voices as we pulled up before the posting-house at Cranbrook. Looking from the window I saw a ring of faces with eyes that gleamed in the light of the lanterns, and every eye was fixed on me, and every foot gave back a step as I descended from the chaise. And while I stood there the postilion came with two white-faced ostlers, who between them bore a heavy burden through the crowd, stumbling awkwardly as they went, and as men saw what they were carrying, there came a low, deep sound, wordless, inarticulate, yet full of menace. But above this murmur a voice rose. I saw the postilion push his way to the steps of the inn and turn there, with hands clenched and raised above his head. "'My master, Sir Maurice Vibart, is killed, shot to death, murdered down there in the haunted holler, he cried. "'And if yax is me who done it, I says to you, he did. So help me, God!' And speaking, he raised his whip and pointed at me. Once more there rose that inarticulate sound of menace, and once more all eyes were fixed upon me. "'You were a fine gentleman,' said a voice. "'And so gay and light-hearted,' said another. "'Aye, a generous and open-handed gentleman,' said a third. At every moment the murmur swelled and grew more threatening. Fists were clenched and sticks flourished, so that instinctively I set my back against the chaise, for it seemed that they lacked only someone to take the initiative ere they fell upon me. The postilion saw this, too, for with a shout he sprang forward, his whip upraised. But as he did so, the crowd was burst asunder. He was caught by a mighty arm, and Black George stood beside me, his eyes glowing, his fists clenched, and his hair and beard bristling. "'Stand back, you chaps,' he growled. "'Stand back, or I'll hurt some on you. "'Be ye all a lot of dogs set on worry ones all alone?' And then he said, turning to me, "'What be the matter with the fools, Peter?' "'Matter?' cried the postilion. "'Murder be the matter. "'My master be murdered, shot to death, "'and there stands the man as done it.' Murder, cried George, in an altered voice. Murder? Now as he spoke, the crowd parted, and four ostlers appeared, bearing a hurdle between them, and on the hurdle lay a figure, an elegant figure whose head and face were still muffled in my neckerchief. I saw George start, and like a flash his glance came round to my bare throat, and dismay was in his eyes. Peter, he murmured. Then he laughed suddenly and clapped his hand down upon my shoulder. Look ye, you chaps, he cried, facing the crowd. This is my friend Peter, an honest man and no murderer, as he will tell you hisself. This is my friend, as I'd go bail for my life to be a true man. Speak up, Peter, and tell him that you am an honest man, 
and no murderer. But I shook my head. Oh, Peter, he whispered, speak, speak. Not here, George, I answered. It would be of no avail. Besides, I can say nothing to clear myself. Nothing, Peter? Nothing, George. This man was shot and killed in the hollow. I found him lying dead. I found the empty pistol and the postilion yonder found me standing over the body. That's all I have to tell. Peter, said he, speaking hurriedly beneath his breath. Oh, Peter, let's run for it. T'would be main easy for the likes of you and me. No, George, I answered. It would be worse than useless. But one thing I do ask of you, you who know me so much better than most, and it is that you will bid me good-bye and take my hand once more, George, here before all the eyes that look upon me as a murderer, and, before I had finished, he had hold of my hand in both of his, nay, had thrown one great arm protectingly about me. Why, Peter, he began in a strangely cracked voice, oh, man as I love, never think as I'd believe their lies, and, Peter, such fighters as you and me, a match for double their number. Let's make a bolt for it. Eh, God, I want to hit somebody. Never doubt me, Peter, your friend, and they'd go over like skittles, like skittles, Peter. The crowd, which had swelled momentarily, surged, opened, and a man on horseback pushed his way toward me, a man in some disorder of dress, as though he had clothed himself in a hurry. Rough hands were now laid upon me. I saw George's fist raised threateningly, but caught it in my grasp. Good-bye, said I. Good-bye, George. Don't look so downcast, man. But we were forced apart, and I was pushed and pulled and hustled away through a crowd of faces whose eyes damned me wherever I looked, along panelled passageways, into a long, dim room, where sat the gentleman I had seen on the horse, busily tying his cravat, to whom I delivered up the pistol, and answered diverse questions as well as I might, and by whom, after much jotting of notes and memoranda, I was delivered over to four burly fellows, who, with deep gravity, and a grip much tighter than was necessary, once more led me out into the moonlit street, where were people who pressed forward to stare into my face, and people who leaned out of windows to stare down upon my head, and many more who followed at my heels. And thus, in much estate, I ascended a flight of worn stone steps into the churchyard, and so, by way of tombs and graves, came at last to the great square church-tower, into which I was incontinently thrust, and there, very securely, locked up. End of How I Set Out to Face My Destiny Section 45 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 44. The Bow Street Runners. It was toward evening of the next day that the door of my prison was opened and two men entered. The first was a tall, cadaverous-looking individual of a melancholy cast of feature, who, despite the season, was wrapped in a long frieze-coat, reaching almost to his heels, from the pocket of which projected a short staff or truncheon. He came forward with his hands in his pockets and his bony chin on his breast, looking at me under the brim of a somewhat weather-beaten hat. That is to say, he looked at my feet and my hands and my throat and my chin, but never seemed to get any higher. His companion, on the contrary, bustled forward and, tapping me familiarly on the shoulder, looked me over with a bright, appraising eye. "'Selp me, Jeremy,' said he, addressing his saturnine friend. "'Selp me. I've ever seen a poor misfortunate cove more to my mind and fancy. Nice and tall and straight-legged, twelve stone if a pound.' A five foot drop now, or say five foot six, and he'll go off as sweet as a bird. Ah, oh, you'll never feel it, McCovey, not a twinge. A little tightish round the windpipe, perhaps, but Lord, it's over soon. You're looking a bit pale round the gills, young cove, but Lord, that's only natural, too. Here he produced from the depths of a capacious pocket something that glittered beneath his agile fingers. And how might be your general health, young cove? He went on affably. Bobbish, I hope. Fair and bobbish? As he spoke, with a sudden dexterous motion, he had snapped something on my wrists, so quickly that at the contact of the cold steel I started, and as I did so, something jingled faintly. There, he exclaimed, clapping me on the shoulder again, but at the same time casting a sharp glance at my shackled wrists. There, now we're all happy and comfortable. I see as your Okovis takes things nice and quiet, and so long as you do, I'm your friend. Bob's my name, and Bobbish is my nature. Lord, the way I've seen which fortunate coves take on at sight of them bracelets, something outrageous. But you, why, well, you're a different kidney. You're my kind. 
You are, what do you say, Jeremy? Don't like his eye, growled that individual. Don't mind Jeremy, winked the other. It's just his perverseness. Lord, he is the perverseest codger you ever did see. Why, he finds fault with the Pope of Rome just because he's in the habit of letting ghosts kiss his toe. I've heard Jeremy work himself up over the Pope and a pint of porter till you'd have thought, and we ain't never a gonna start, inquired Jeremy, staring out the window with his back to us. And where, said I, might you be taking me? Why, since you asked my covey, we have taken you to where you'll be took good care on, where you'll feed well and have justice done on you. Trust us for that. Though, to be sure, I'm sorry to take you from such proper quarters as these, nice and airy, eh, Jeremy? Ah, and with a fine view of the graves, growled Jeremy, leading the way out. In the street stood a chaise and four, surrounded by a pushing, jostling throng of men, women, and children, who, catching sight of me between the Bow Street runners, forgot to push and jostle and stared at me with every eye and tooth they possessed, until I was hidden in the chaise. "'Right away,' growled Jeremy, shutting the door with a bang. "'Whoa!' roared a voice, and a great shaggy golden head was thrust in at the window, and a hand reached down and grasped mine. "'A pipe and vacuum, Peter, for me, a flask of rum, Simon's best from Simon, and chicken sandwiches from my prue,' this as he passed in each article through the window. And I were to say, Peter, as we're all with you, ever and ever, and I were likewise to tell ye as how Prue'll pray for ye oftener than before, and, e God, he broke off, the tears running down his face. There were a lot more, but I forgot it all. Only, Peter, me and Simon be going to get a lawyer chap for ye, and, ah, oh, man, Peter, say the word, and I'll have ye out of this in a twinkling, and we'll run for it. But even as I shook my head, the postboy's whip cracked, and the horses plunged forward. Goodbye, George, I cried. Goodbye, dear fellow and the last I saw of him was as he stood, rubbing his tears away with one fist and shaking the other after the chaise. Chapter 45, which concerns itself, among other matters, with the boots of the Saturnine Jeremy. A bottle of rum, said the man Bob, and taking it up, very abstracted of eye, he removed the cork, sniffed at it, tasted it, took a gulp, and handed it over to his companion, who also looked at it, sniffed it, and tasted it. "'And what do you make of that, Jeremy?' "'Tasted better for now,' growled Jeremy, and immediately took another pull. "'Sandwiches, too,' pursued the man Bob, in a ruminating tone. "'I always was partial to chicken.' And forthwith, opening the dainty parcel, he helped himself and his companion also. "'What do you make of them, Jeremy?' he inquired, munching. "'I've eaten worse,' rumbled Jeremy, also munching. "'Young cove, they does you credit.' said the man Bob, nodding to me with great urbanity. Great credit. There ain't many misfortunates can produce such sandwiches as them, though to be sure they eats uncommon quick old lard in there, Jeremy. But indeed the sandwiches were already only a memory, wherefore his brow grew black, and he glared at the still munching Jeremy, who met his looks with his usual impenetrable gloom. A pipe and backa mused the man Bob, after we'd ridden some while in silence, and with the same serene unconsciousness of manner, he took the pipe, filled it, lighted it, and puffed, with an air of dreamy content. Jeremy's a goodish sort, he began, with a complacent flourish of the pipe. A goodish sort, but cross-grained. Lord, young cove, his cross-grainedness is a gull only by his perverseness. And cause why? Cause he don't smoke. Go easy with the rum, Jeremy. There's nothing like a pipe of backer to soothe such things away. I got my eye on you, Jeremy. No, there's nothing like a pipe of backa. Look at me. I were the perversest infant that ever was, till I took to smoking. And today, whatever I am, I ain't perverse, nor yet cross-grained. And many a misfortunate cove, as is now no more, has wept over me at parting. They generally always do, growled Jeremy, uncorking the rum bottle with his teeth. No, Jerry, no, returned the other, blowing out a cloud of smoke. Misfortunates ain't all the same. Are you with that bottle? You have criers and laughers and prayers and silent ones, and the silent coves is the dangerousest. Are you with the bottle, Jeremy? Now you, McCovey, he went on, tapping my hand gently with his pipe stem, you ain't exactly talkative. In fact, not wishing no offense, I might say as you was inclined to be one of the silent ones. Not as old's that against you, far from it. Only you reminds me of a young cove as had the misfortune to get hisself took for a forgery, and who, order me a talkin' and a chattin' to him in my pleasant way, went and managed to commit suicide under my very nose. 
which were hardly nice or even respectable, considering. Arty, you with the bottle, Jeremy! Jeremy growled, held up the bottle to the failing light of evening, measured its contents with his thumb, and extended it unwillingly toward his comrade's ready hand. But it never got there, for at that instant the chaise lurched violently. There was a cry, a splintering of glass, a crash, and I was lying, half-stunned in a ditch, listening to the chorus of oaths and cries that rose from the cloud of dust where the frightened horses reared and plunged. How long I remained thus I cannot say, but all at once I found myself upon my feet, running down the road, for hazy though my mind yet was, I could think only of escape, of liberty and freedom, at any price, at any cost. So I ran on down the road, somewhat unsteadily as yet, because my fall had been a heavy one, and my brain still reeled. I heard a shot behind me, the sharp crack of a pistol, and a bullet sang over my head, and then I knew they were after me, for I could hear the patter of their feet upon the hard road. Now as I ran, my brain cleared, but this only served me to appreciate the difficulty of eluding men so seasoned and hardy as my pursuers. Moreover, the handcuffs galled my wrists, and the short connecting chain hampered my movements considerably, and I saw that upon this straight level I must soon be run down or shot from behind. Glancing back, I beheld them some hundred yards or so away, elbows in, heads up, running with that long, free stride that speaks of endurance. I increased the pace, the ground flew beneath me, but when I glanced again, though the man Bob had dropped back, the Saturnine Jeremy ran on, no nearer, but no farther than before. Now as I went, I presently espied that for which I had looked, a gate set in the midst of the hedge, but it was closed, and never did a gate before or since appear quite so high and insurmountable but with the desperation of despair I turned and ran at it, and sprang, swinging my arms above my head as I did so. My foot grazed the top bar, down I came, slipped, stumbled, regained my balance, and ran on over the springy turf. I heard a crash behind me, an oath, a second pistol barked, and immediately it seemed that a hot iron seared my forearm, and glancing down I saw the skin cut and bleeding, but finding it no worse, breathed a sigh of thankfulness, and ran on. By that leap I had probably gained some twenty yards. I would nurse my strength, therefore, if I could once gain the woods. How far off were they? Half a mile? A mile? Well, I could run that easily, thanks to my hardy life. Stay! What was that sound behind me? The fall of flying feet, or the throbbing of my own heart? I turned my head. The man Jeremy was within twelve yards of me. Lean and spare, his head thrust forward, he ran with the long, easy stride of a greyhound. So it was to be a question of endurance? Well, I had caught my second wind by now. I set my teeth, and clenching my fists, lengthened my stride. And now, indeed, the real struggle began. My pursuer had long ago abandoned his coat, but his boots were heavier and clumsier than those I wore. But then again, my confining shackles seemed to contract my chest, and the handcuffs galled my wrists cruelly. On I went, scattering flocks of scampering sheep, past meditative cows who started up, puffing out snorts of perfume, scrambling through hedges over gate and stile and ditch, with eyes upon the distant woods full of the purple gloom of evening, and in my ears the muffled thud, 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 thud of the pursuit, sometimes seeming much nearer, sometimes much farther off, but always the same rhythmic, remorseless thud, 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 thud. On and ever on, climbing steep uplands, plunging down precipitous slopes, past brawling brooks and silent pools, all red and gold with sunset, past oak and ash and thorn, on and on, with ever those thudding footfalls close behind, and as we ran it seemed to me that our feet beat out a kind of cadence, his heavy shoes and my lighter ones, thud, thud, pad, pad, thud, thud, pad, pad, until they would suddenly become confused and mingled with each other. One moment it seemed I almost loved the fellow, the next I bitterly hated him. Whether I had gained or not I could not tell, to look back was to lose ground. The woods were close now, so close that I fancied I heard the voice of their myriad leaves calling to me, encouraging me. But my breath was panting thick and short, my stride was less sure, my wrists were raw and bleeding, and the ceaseless jingle of my chain maddened me. Thud, thud, untiring, persistent, thud, thud, the pulse at my temples throbbed in time with it, my breath panted to it, and surely it was nearer, more distinct. Yes, he had gained on me in the last half-mile, but how much! I cast a look over my shoulder. It was but a glance, yet I saw that he had lessened the distance between us by half. His face shone with sweat, his mouth was a line, his nostrils broad and expanded, his eyes staring and shot with blood, 
but he ran on with the same long, easy stride that was slowly but surely wearing me down. We were descending a long grassy slope, and I stumbled more than once, and rolled in my course, but on came those remorseless footfalls, thud, 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 strong and sure as ever. He was nearing me fast, he was close upon me, closer, within reach of me. I could hear his whistling breaths, and then all at once I was down on hands and knees. He tried to avoid me, failed, and shooting high over me, thudded down upon the grass. For a moment he lay still, then, with a groan, he rolled over and propped himself on his arm, thrust a hand into his bosom, but I hurled myself upon him, and after a brief struggle, twisted the pistol from his grasp, whereupon he groaned again. Hurt? I panted. Arm broke, I think, he growled, and forthwith burst out in a torrent of curses. Does it hurt so much? I panted. Ah, but it ain't that, he panted back. It's me, a letting of you work off a moldy old trick on me like that. It was my only chance, said I, sitting down beside him, to regain my wind. To think, he growled, a me being took in by a... But you're a great runner, said I. A great fool, you mean, to be took in by a... You have a long walk back, and your arm will be painful. And serve me right for being took in by... If you will lend me your neckerchief, I think I can make your arm more comfortable, said I. He ceased cursing to stare at me. Slowly and awkwardly unwound the article in question and passed it to me. Thereupon, having located the fracture, I contrived a rough splint with a piece of wood lying near, which done, he thanked me, in a burst of profanity, and rose. "'I've seen worse coves nor you,' said he, "'and one good turn deserving another. Lie snug all day and travel by night. Keep to the by-roads. This ain't no common case. There'll be a thousand pounds on your head before the week's out, so look spry, my cove.' Saying which, he nodded, turned upon his heel, and strode away, cursing to himself. Now presently as I went I heard the merry ring and clink of hammer and anvil, and guided by the sound came to a tumble-down smithy, where was a man busily at work with a shock-headed boy at the bellows. At sight of me the smith set down his hammer and stared open-mouthed, as did also the shock-headed boy. How long would it take you to file off these shackles? I inquired, holding out my hands. To file them off? Yes. Why, that, that depends. Then do it, as soon as you can. Upon this the man turned his back to me and began rummaging among his tools, with his head very near that of the shock-headed boy, until having found a file suitable to the purpose, he set to work on my handcuffs. But he progressed so slowly, for one reason and another, that I began to grow impatient. Moreover, noticing that the shock-headed boy had disappeared, I bade him desist. "'A cold chisel and hammer will be quickest,' said I. "'Come, cut me off this chain. Here, close up to the rivets.' And when he had done this, I took his file— thrusting it beneath my coat, set off, running my hardest, leaving him to stare after me, with his eyes and mouth wider than ever. The sun was gone down when I reached the woods, and here in the kind shadows I stayed a while to rest and rid myself of handcuffs, but when I felt for the file to do so, it was gone. End of Which Concerns Itself, Among Other Matters, With the Boots of the Saturnine Jeremy Section 46 of The Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 46. How I Came to London. Justly to narrate all that befell me during my flight and journey to London would fill many pages, and therefore, as this book of mine is already a magnitude far beyond my first expectations, I shall hurry on to the end of my story. Acting upon the advice of the Saturnine Jeremy, I lay hidden by day and travelled by night, avoiding the highway. But in doing so, I became so often involved in the maze of crossroads, by-lanes, cow-paths, and cart-tracks, that twice the dawn found me as completely lost as though I had been set down in the midst of the Sahara. I thus wasted much time and wandered many miles out of my way, wherefore to put an end to these futile ramblings I set my face westward, hoping to strike the high road, somewhere between Tunbridge and Sevenoaks, determined rather to run the chance of capture than follow haphazard these tortuous and interminable byways. It was then, upon the third night since my escape, that, faint and spent with hunger, I saw before me the welcome sight of a finger-post, and hurrying forward, eager to learn my whereabouts, 
came full upon a man who sat beneath the finger-post with a hunch of bread and meat upon his knee, which he was eating by means of a clasp-knife. Now I had tasted nothing save two apples all day, and but little the day before. Thus, at sight of this appetizing food, my hunger grew, and increased to a violent desire, before which prudence vanished and caution flew away. Therefore I approached the man with my eyes upon his bread and meat. But as I drew nearer, my attention was attracted by something white that was nailed up against the finger-post, and I stopped dead, with my eyes riveted by a word printed in great black capitals, and stood oblivious alike of the man who had stopped eating to stare at me, and the bread and meat that he had set down upon the grass. For what I saw was this. G. R. Murder. Five hundred pound reward. Whereas Peter Smith, blacksmith, late of Sissinghurst, in the county of Kent, suspected of the crime of willful murder, did upon the 10th of August last make his escape from his gaolers, upon the Tunbridge Road somewhere between Sissinghurst and Pembury. The above reward, namely five hundred pounds, will be paid to such person or persons who shall give such information as shall lead to the arrest and apprehension of the aforesaid Peter Smith, in the furtherance of which is hereunto added a just and close description of the same, viz. he is six foot tall, a sizable rogue, his hair black, his eyes dark and piercing, clad when last seen in a worn velveteen jacket, knee-breeches buckled at the knees, grey worsted stockings and patched shoes, the coat torn at the right shoulder, upon his wrists a pair of steel handcuffs, last seen in the vicinity of Pembry. While I yet stared at this, I was conscious that the man had risen, and now stood at my elbow, also that in one hand he carried a short, heavy stick. He stood very still, and with bent head, apparently absorbed in the printed words before him, but more than once I saw his eyes gleam in the shadow of his hat-brim, as they turned to scan me furtively up and down. Yet he did not speak or move, and there was something threatening, I thought, in his immobility. Wherefore I, in turn, watched him narrowly from the corner of my eye, and thus it chanced that our glances met. "'You seem thoughtful,' said I. "'Ah, I be that. And what might you be thinking?' "'Why, since you ax me, I was thinking as your eye was mighty sharp and piercing.' "'Ah,' said I, "'and what more?' "'That your coat was tore at the shoulder.' "'So it is,' I nodded. "'Well, you likewise wears buckled breeches and grey worsted stockings. "'You're a very observant man,' said I. "'Though to be sure,' said he, shaking his head, "'I don't see no handcuffs. "'That is because they are hidden under my sleeves.' "'Ah!' said he, and I saw the stick quiver in his grip. "'As I said before, you are a very observant man,' said I, watching the stick. "'Well, I've got eyes and can see as much as most folk,' he retorted, "'and here the stick quivered again. "'Yes,' I nodded, "'you also possess legs and can probably walk fast. "'Ah, and run too, if need be,' he added significantly. "'Then suppose you start.' "'Start where?' "'Anywhere, so long as you do start.' "'Not without you, my buck. "'I've took a powerful fancy to you, "'and that there are five hundred pounds.' "'Here his left hand shot out and grasped my collar. "'So supposing you come along with me. "'And no tricks, mind, no tricks, or... "'Ah, would ye? "'The heavy stick whirled up, but quick as he, "'I had caught his wrist, "'and now presented my pistol full in his face. "'Drop that stick.' said I, pressing the muzzle of the weapon lightly against his forehead as I spoke. At the touch of the cold steel his body suddenly stiffened and grew rigid, his eyes opened in a horrified stare, and the stick clattered down on the road. Talking of fancies, I pursued, I have a great mind to that smock frock of yours, so take it off and quick about it. In a fever of haste he tore off the garment in question, and, he thrusting it eagerly upon me, I folded it over my arm. Now, said I, since you say you can run, supposing you show me what you can do. This is a good straight lane. Off with you, and do your best, and no turning or stopping, mind, for the moon is very bright, and I am a pretty good shot. Hardly waiting to hear me out, the fellow set off up the lane, running like the wind, whereupon I, waiting only to snatch up his forgotten bread and meat, took to my heels down the lane, so that, when I presently stopped to don the smock-frock, its late possessor had vanished as though he'd never been. I hurried on, nevertheless, eating greedily as I went, and after some while left the narrow lane behind, and came out on the broad highway that stretched like a great white ribbon unrolled beneath the moon, and here was another finger-post, with the words, 
to Sevenoaks, Tunbridge, and the Wells, to Bromley and London. And here also was another placard, headed by that awful word murder, which seemed to leap out at me from the rest. And with that word there rushed over me the memory of Charmian as I had seen her stand, white-lipped, haggard of eye, and with one hand hidden in the folds of her gown. So I turned and strove to flee from this hideous word, and as I went I clenched my fists and cried within myself, I love her, I love her, no doubt can come between us more, I love her, love her, love her. Thus I hurried on along the great high road, but wherever I looked I saw this most hateful word. It shone out palely from the shadows, it was scored into the dust at my feet, even across the splendor of the moon in jagged characters. I seemed to read that awful word, murder. And the soft night wind woke voices to whisper it as I passed. The somber trees and gloomy hedgerows were full of it. I heard it in the echo of my step, murder, murder. It was always there, whether I walked or ran, in rough and stony places, in the deep soft dust, in the dewy tender grass, it was always there, whispering at my heels and refusing to be silenced. I had gone on in this way for an hour or more, avoiding the middle of the road because of the brilliance of the moon, when I overtook something that crawled in the gloom of the hedge, and approaching, pistol in hand, saw that it was a man. He was creeping forward slowly and painfully on his hands and knees, but all at once sank down on his face in the grass, only to rise, groaning, and creep on once more, and as he went I heard him praying, Lord, give me strength, O oh, Lord, give me strength, Angela! Angela, it is so far, so far. And groaning, he sank down again upon his face. You are ill, said I, bending over him. I must reach Deptford. She's buried at Deptford, and I shall die tonight. Oh, Lord, give me strength, he panted. Deptford is miles away, said I. Now as I spoke, he lifted himself upon his hands and stared up at me. I saw a haggard, hairy face, very thin and sunken, but a fire burned in the eyes, and the eyes seemed somehow familiar. You, he cried, and spat up in the air toward me. Devil, he cried, devil, Vibart. I recoiled instinctively before the man's sudden wild ferocity, but propping himself against the bank, he shook his hand at me and laughed. Devil, he repeated, shade, ghost of a devil, have you come back to see me die? Who are you, I cried, bending to look into the pale, emaciated face. Who are you? A shadow, he answered, passing a shaking hand up over his face and brow a ghost, a phantom, as you are, but my name was Strickland once, as yours was Devil Vibart. I am changed of late. You said so in the hollow, and laughed. You don't laugh now, Devil Vibart. You remember poor John Strickland now? You are the outside passenger, I exclaimed, the madman who followed and shot at me in a wood. Followed? Yes, I was a shadow that was always behind you, following and following you, Satan Vibart, tracking and tracking you to hell and damnation. And you fled here, and you fled there, but I was always behind you. You hid from me among lowly folk, but you could not escape the shadow. Many times I would have killed you, but she was between. The woman. I came once to your cottage. It was night, and the door opened beneath my hand, but your time was not then. But ha! I met you among the trees, as I did once before, and I told you my name, as I did once before. And I spoke of her, of Angela, and cried her name, and shot you just here, above the brow. So you died, Devil Vibart, as soon I must, for my mission is accomplished. It was you, I cried, kneeling beside him. It was your hand that shot Sir Maurice Vibart? Yes, he answered, his voice growing very gentle as he went on. For Angela's sake, my dead wife. And fumbling in his pocket, he drew out a woman's small lace-edged handkerchief, and I saw that it was thickened and black with blood. This was hers, he continued, in her hand the night she died. I had meant to lay it on her grave, the blood of atonement, but now... A sudden crash in the hedge above, a figure silhouetted against the sky, a shadowy arm that, falling, struck the moon out of heaven, and in the darkness I was down upon my knees and fingers were about my throat. Oh, Darby, cried a voice, I've got him this way, quick! Oh, Darb! My fist drove into his ribs. I struggled up under a rain of blows, and we struck and swayed and staggered and struck, trampling the groaning wretch who lay dying in the ditch. And before me was the pale oval of a face, and I smote it twice with my pistol butt, and it was gone, and I was running along the road. 
Charmian spoke truth. Oh, God, I thank thee. I burst through a hedge, running on and on, careless alike of being seen, of capture or escape, of prison or freedom, for in my heart was a great joy. I was conscious of shouts and cries, but I heeded them no more, listening only to the song of happiness my heart was singing. Charmian spoke the truth, her hands are clean. Oh, God, I thank thee. And as I went, I presently espied a caravan, and before it a fire of sticks, above which a man was bending, who, raising his head, stared at me as I approached. He was a strange-looking man, who glared at me with one eye, and leered jocosely with the other, and being spent and short of breath, I stopped, and wiping the sweat from my eyes, I saw that it was blood. "'How is Lewis?' I panted. "'What?' exclaimed the man, drawing nearer. "'Is it you, James? But you're a picture you are. Hello!' He stopped as his glance encountered the steel that glittered upon my wrist, while upon the silence the shouts swelled, drawing nearer and nearer. "'So the runners are to you, are they, young feller?' "'Yes,' I said, "'yes. "'You have only to cry out, and they will take me, "'for I can fight no more, nor run any further. "'This knock on the head has made me very dizzy.' "'Then take a pull at this here,' he said, "'and thrust a flat bottle into my hand. "'The fiery spirit burned my throat, "'but almost immediately my strength and courage revived. "'Better?' "'Much better,' I answered, returning the bottle, "'and I thank you.' "'Don't go for to thank me, young feller,' said he, "'driving the cork into the bottle with a blow of his fist.' You think that young feller has once done as much for me? At a fair. And now, cut away, run. The edge is good and dark up yonder. Lay low a bit and leave these damn runners to me. I obeyed without more ado, and as I ran up the lane, I heard him shouting and swearing as though engaged in a desperate encounter. And turning in the shadow of the hedge, I saw him met by two men, with whom, still shouting and gesticulating excitedly, he set off running down the lane. And so I once more turned my face Londonward, the blood still flowed from the cut in my head, getting often into my eyes, yet I made good progress notwithstanding. But little by little the effect of the spirits wore off. A drowsiness stole over me, my limbs felt numbed and heavy, and with this came strange fancies and a dread of the dark. Sometimes it seemed that odd lights danced before my eyes like marsh fires, and strange voices gabbled in my ears, furiously unintelligible, with laughter in a high-pitched key. Sometimes I cast myself down in the dewy grass, only to start up again, trembling, and run on till I was breathless. But ever I struggled forward, despite the throbbing of my broken head and the gnawing hunger that consumed me. After a while a mist came on, a mist that formed itself into deep valleys, or rose in jagged spires and pinnacles, but constantly changing, a mist that moved and writhed within itself. And in this mist were forms, nebulous and indistinct, multitudes that moved in time with me, and the voices seemed louder than before and the laughter much shriller, while repeated over and over again, I caught that awful word, murder, murder. Chief among this host walked one whose head and face were muffled from my sight, but who watched me, I knew, through the folds, with eyes that stared fixed and wide. But now, indeed, the mist seemed to have gone into my brain, and all things were hazy, and my memory of them is dim. Yet I recall passing Bromley Village and slinking furtively through the shadows of the deserted high street, but thereafter all is blank, save a memory of pain and toil and deadly fatigue. I was stumbling up steps, the steps of a terrace. A great house lay before me, and lighted windows here and there. But these I feared, and so came creeping to one that I knew well, and whose dark panes glittered palely under the dying moon. Now I took out my clasp knife, and fumbling blindly, put back the catch, as I had often done as a boy. And so, the window opening, I clambered into the dimness beyond. Now as I stumbled forward, my hand touched something, a long, dark object that was covered with a cloth, and hardly knowing what I did, I drew back this cloth and looked down at that which it had covered, and sank down on my knees, groaning. For there, staring up at me, cold, contemptuous, and set like marble, was the smiling, dead face of my cousin Maurice. As I knelt there, I was conscious that the door had opened, that someone approached bearing the light, but I did not move or heed. Peter? Good God in heaven, is it Peter? I looked up and into the dilated eyes of Sir Richard. "'Is it really, Peter?' he whispered. "'Yes, sir. Dying, I think. "'No, no, Peter, dear boy. "'You didn't know. You hadn't heard. "'Poor Maurice murdered. Fellow name of Smith.' "'Yes, Sir Richard. I know more about it than most. "'You see, I am Peter Smith.' "'Sir Richard fell back from me, "'and I saw the candle swaying in his grasp. "'You?' he whispered. "'You? Oh, Peter. Oh, my boy.' 
But I am innocent, innocent. You believe me, you who were my earliest friend, my good, kind friend, you believe me? And I stretched out my hands appealingly. But as I did so, the light fell gleaming on my shameful wristlets, and even as we gazed into each other's eyes, mute and breathless, came the sound of steps and hushed voices. Sir Richard sprang forward, and catching me in a powerful hand, half led, half dragged me behind a tall leather screen beside the hearth, and thrusting me into a chair, turned and hurried to meet the intruders. They were three, as I soon discovered by their voices, one of which I thought I recognized. "'It's a devilish shame,' the first was saying. "'Not a soul here for the funeral but our four selves. "'I say it's a shame, a burning shame.' "'That, sir, depends entirely on the point of view,' answered the second, "'a somewhat aggressive voice, and this it was I seemed to recognize. "'Point of view, sir? "'Where, I should like to know, are all those smiling non-entities, "'those fawning sycophants who were once so proud of his patronage, "'who openly modelled themselves upon him, whose highest ambition was to be called a friend of the famous Buck Vibart. Where are they now? Doing the same by the present favorite, as is the nature of their kind, responded the third. Poor Maurice is already forgotten. The prince, said the harsh voice, the prince would never have forgotten him for crossing him in the affair of the Lady Sophia Sefton. The day he ran off with her, he was as surely dead in a social sense as he is now in every sense. Here the mist settled down upon my brain once more, and I heard nothing but a confused murmur of voices, and it seemed to me that I was back on the road again, hemmed in by those gibbering phantoms that spoke so much, but said but one word, murder. Quick, a candle here, a candle, bring a light. There came a glare before my smarting eyes, and I struggled to my feet. Why, I have seen this fellow's face somewhere. Ah, yes, at an inn. A hangdog, rogue. I threatened to pull his nose, I remember, and, by heaven, handcuffs! He has been roughly handled, too. Gentlemen, I'll lay my life the murderer is found, though how he should come here of all places is extraordinary. Sir Richard, you and I as magistrates, duty! But the mist was very thick, and the voices grew confused again. Only I knew that hands were upon me, and I was led into another room, where were lights that glittered upon the silver, and decanters and glasses of a supper table. Yes, I was saying slowly and heavily, Yes, I am Peter Smith, a blacksmith, who escaped from his gaolers on the Tonbridge Road, but I am innocent. Before God, I am innocent. And now, do with me as you will, for I am very weary. Sir Richard's arm was about me, and his voice sounded in my ears, but as though a great way off. Sirs, said he, this is my friend Sir Peter Vibart. There was a moment's pause, then a chair fell with a crash, and there arose a confusion of excited voices, which grew suddenly silent, for the door had opened, and on the threshold stood a woman, tall and proud and richly dressed, from the little dusty boot that peeped beneath her habit to the wide sweeping hat brim that shaded the high beauty of her face, and I would have gone to her, but my strength failed me. Charmian! She started, and turning, uttered a cry, and ran to me. Charmian, said I. Oh, Charmian! And so, with her tender arms about me and her kisses on my lips, the mist settled down upon me, thicker and darker than ever. End of How I Came to London Section 47 of The Broad Highway This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ellen Preckle. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnall. Chapter 47. In which this history is ended. A bright room, luxuriously appointed. A great wide bed with carved posts and embroidered canopy. Between the curtained windows, a tall oak press with grotesque heads carved thereon. Heads that leered and gaped and scowled at me. But the bed and the room and the oak press were all familiar. And the grotesque heads had leered and gaped and frowned at me before and haunted my boyish dreams many and many a night. And now I lay between sleeping and waking, staring dreamily at all these things, till roused by a voice nearby, and starting up, broad awake, beheld Sir Richard. "'Deuce take you, Peter!' he exclaimed. "'I say, the devil fly away with you, my boy. Curse me! A nice pickle you've made of yourself, with your infernal revolutionary notions, your digging and blacksmithing, your walking tours.' "'Where is she, Sir Richard?' I broke in. "'Pray, where is she?' She, he returned, scratching his chin with the corner of a letter he held. She, 
She whom I saw last night. You were asleep last night and the night before. Asleep? Then how long have I been here? Three days, Peter. And where is she? Surely I have not dreamed it all. Where is Charmian? She went away this morning. Gone! Where to? Gad, Peter, how should I know? But, seeing the distress in my face, he smiled and tendered me the letter. She left this. For Peter when he awoke, and I've been waiting for Peter to wake all morning. Hastily I broke the seal, and unfolding the paper with a tremulous hand, read, Dearest, noblest, and most disbelieving of Peter's, Oh, did you think you could hide your hateful suspicion from me, from me who knows you so well? I felt it in your kiss, in the touch of your strong hand, I saw it in your eyes. Even when I told you the truth and begged you to believe me, even then, deep down, in your heart, you thought it was my hand that had killed Sir Maurice, and God only knows the despair that filled me as I turned and left you. And so, Peter, perhaps to punish you a little, perhaps because I cannot bear the noisy world just yet, perhaps because I fear you a little, I have run away. But I remember also how, believing me guilty, you loved me still, and gave yourself up to shield me, and dying of hunger and fatigue came to find me. And so, Peter, I have not run so very far, nor hidden myself so very close, and if you understand me as you should, your search need not be so very long. And dear, dear Peter, there is just one other thing which I hoped that you would guess, which any other would have guessed, but which, being a philosopher, you never did guess. Oh, Peter, I was once, very long ago, it seems, Sophia Charmian Sefton, but I am now and always was your humble person, Charmian. The letter fell from my fingers, and I remained staring before me so long that Sir Richard came and laid his hand on my shoulder. Oh, boy, said he very tenderly, she has told me all the story, and I think, Peter, I think it is given to very few men to win the love of such a woman as this. God knows it, said I, and to have married one so very noble and high in all things. You should be very proud, Peter. I am, said I. Oh, I am, sir. Even, Peter, even though she be a virago, this Lady Sophia, or a termagant. I was a great fool in those days, said I, hanging my head, and very young. It was only six months ago, Peter. But I am years older today, sir, and the husband of the most glorious woman, the most, oh, curse me, Peter, if you deserve such a goddess. And she worked for me, said I, cooked and served and mended my clothes. Where are they? I cried and sprang out of bed. What the deuce? began Sir Richard. My clothes, said I, looking vainly about my clothes. Pray, Sir Richard, where are they? Burnt, Peter. Burnt. Every blood-stained rag, he nodded. Her orders. But what am I to do? Sir Richard laughed and crossed to the press and opened the door. Here are all the things you left behind when you set out to dig and egad make your fortune. I couldn't let them go with all the rest, so I had them brought here to keep them for you ready for a time when you should grow tired of digging and come back to me and oh damn it you understand and granger's waiting to see you in the library been there hours so dress yourself in heaven's name dress yourself he cried and hurried from the room it was with a certain satisfaction that i once more donned buckskin and spurred boots and noticed moreover how tight my coat was become across the shoulders yet i dressed hastily for my mind was already on the road galloping to charmian in the library I found Sir Richard and Mr. Granger, who greeted me with his precise little bow. "'I have to congratulate you, Sir Peter,' he began, "'not only on your distinguished marriage and accession to fortune, "'but upon the fact that the, uh, unpleasantness "'connecting a certain Peter Smith with your unfortunate cousin's late decease "'has been entirely removed by means of the murderer's written confession, "'placed in my hands some days ago by the Lady Sophia. "'A written confession, and she brought it to you?' "'Galloped all the way from Tunbridge, by gad,' nodded Sir Richard. "'It seems,' pursued Mr. Granger, "'that the, uh, man, John Strickland, by name, "'lodged with a certain preacher, "'to whom, in Lady Vibart's presence, "'he confessed his crime "'and willingly wrote out a deposition to that effect. "'It also appears that the man, sick though he was, "'wandered from the preacher's cottage "'and was eventually found upon the road, "'and now lies in Maidstone Gale in a dying condition.' Chancing presently to look from the window, I beheld a groom who led a horse up and down before the door, and the groom was Adam, and the horse... I opened the window, and leaning out, called a name. At the sound of my voice, the man smiled and touched his hat, and the mare ceased her pawing and chafing, and turned upon me a pair of great soft eyes, and snuffed the air, and whinnied. So I leaped out of the window and down the steps, and thus it was that I met Wings. 
"'She be in the pinker condition, sir,' said Adam proudly. "'Sir Richard bought her for a song,' added the baronet, who, with Mr. Granger, had followed to bid me good-bye. "'I really got her remarkably cheap,' he explained, thrusting his fist deep into his pockets and frowning down my thanks. But when I had swung myself into the saddle, he came and laid his hand on my knee. "'You are going to find her, Peter?' "'Yes, sir. And you know where to look?' "'I think so. Because if you don't, I might—' "'I shall go to a certain cottage,' said I tentatively. "'Then you'd better go, boy. The mare's all excitement. Good-bye, Peter. And cutting up my gravel most damnably. Good-bye.' So saying, he reached up and gripped my hand very hard, and stared at me also very hard, though tears stood in his eyes. "'I have always felt very fatherly toward you, Peter. And you won't forget the lonely old man.' "'Come and see me now and then, both of you, "'for it does get damnably lonely here sometimes, "'and, oh, curse it, good-bye, dear lad.' "'So he turned and walked up the steps "'into his great lonely house. "'O oh, wings, with thy slender grace and tireless strength, "'if ever thou didst gallop before, "'do thy best to-day. "'Spurn, spurn the dust neath thy fleet hoofs. "'Stretch thy graceful Arab neck. "'Bear me gallantly to-day, O oh, wings, "'for never shalt thou and I see its like again.' Swiftly we flew with the wind before and the dust behind, past wayside inns where besmocked figures paused in their grave discussions to turn and watch us by, past smiling field and darkling copse, past lonely cottage and village green, through Seven Oaks and Tunbridge, with never a stop, up Pembry Hill and down, galloping so lightly, so easily, over that hard familiar road which I had lately tramped with so much toil and pain, and so, as evening fell, to Sissinghurst. A dreamy, sleepy place is Sissinghurst at all times, for its few cottages, like its inn, are very old, and great age begets dreams. But when the sun is low, and the shadows creep out, when the old inn blinks drowsy eyes at the cottages, and they blink back drowsily at the inn, like the old friends they are, when distant cows low at gates and fences, when sheep bells tinkle faintly, when the weary toiler seated sideways on his weary horse, homewards nodding sleepily with every plodding hoof fall but rousing to give one a drowsy good night then who can resist the somnolent charm of the place save only the bull himself snorting down in lofty contempt as rolling of eye as curly of horn as stiff as to tail as any indignant bull ever was or shall be but as i rode watching the evening deepen about me soft and clear rose the merry chime of hammer and anvil and turning aside to the smithy i paused there and stooping my head, looked in at the door. "'George,' said I. He started erect, and dropping hammer and tongs, came out, running, then stopped suddenly as one abashed. "'Oh, friend,' said I, "'don't you know me?' "'Why, Peter,' he stammered and broke off, "'have you no greeting for me, George?' "'I—I I, I heard you was free, Peter, and I was glad, "'glad because you was the man I loved, and I waited. "'I have been waiting for you to come back, "'but now you be so changed, so fine and grand, and I be all black with soot from the fire. Oh, man, you bant my Peter no more. Never say that, George, never say that, I cried, and leaping from the saddle I would have caught his hand in mine, but he drew back. You be so fine and grand, Peter, and I be all sooty from the fire, he repeated. I'd just like to wash my hands first. Oh, black George, said I, dear George. Be you rich now, Peter? Yes, I suppose so. A gentleman with horses and houses and servants? Well, what of it? I'd like to wash my hands first, if so be you don't mind, Peter. George, said I, don't be a fool. Now as we stood thus fronting each other in the doorway, I heard a light step upon the road behind me, and turning beheld Prudence. Oh, Prue, George is afraid of my clothes and won't shake hands with me. For a moment she hesitated, looking from one to the other of us. Then all at once, laughing a little and blushing a little, she leaned forward and kissed me. Why, George, said she, still blushing, how foolish you be. Mr. Peter were as much a gentleman in his leather apron as ever he is in his fine coat. How foolish you be. So proud George gave me his hand, grimy as it was, rejoicing over me because of my good fortune, and mourning over me because my smithing days were over. You see, Peter, when men has worked together, and sorrowed together, and fought together, and knocked each other down like you and me, it bean't so easy to say good-bye. So if you must leave us, why, don't let's say it. No, George. There shall be no good-byes for either one of us, and I shall come back soon. Until then, take my mare, have her made comfortable for me, and now good-night, good-night. And so, clasping their loving hands, I turned away, somewhat hurriedly, and left them. There was no moon, but the night was luminous with stars, and as I strode along, my eyes were often lifted to the wonder of the heavens, 
and I wondered which particular star was Charmian's and which was mine. Reaching the hollow, I paused to glance about me as I ever did before descending that leafy path, and the shadows were very black, and a chill wind stirred among the leaves, so that I shivered, and wondered for the first time if I had come right, if the cottage had been Charmian's mind when she wrote. Then I descended the path, hurrying past a certain dark spot, and coming at last within sight of the cottage, I paused again, and shivered, for the windows were dark and the door shut. But the latch yielded readily beneath my hand, so I went in and closed and barred the door behind me. For upon the hearth a fire burned with a dim red glow that filled the place with shadows, and the shadows were very deep. Charmian, said I, oh, Charmian, are you there? Have I guessed right? I heard a rustle close beside me, and in the gloom came a hand to meet and clasp my own. Wherefore I stooped and kissed those slender fingers, drawing her into the fire glow, and her eyes were hidden by their lashes, and the glow of the fire seemed reflected in her cheeks. The candles were so bright, Peter, she whispered. Yes, and so when I heard you coming, you heard me? I was sitting on the bench outside, Peter. And when you heard me, you put the candles out? They seemed so very bright, Peter. And shut the door? I only just closed it, Peter. She was still wrapped in her cloak as she had been when I first saw her, wherefore I put back the hood from her face, and behold, as I did so, her hair fell down, rippling over my arm, and covering us both in splendor as it had done once before. Indeed, you have glorious hair, said I. It seems wonderful to think that you are my wife. I can scarcely believe it even yet. Why, I had meant you should marry me from the first, Peter. Had you? Do you think I should ever have come back to this dear solitude otherwise? Now, when I would have kissed her, she turned her head aside. Peter. Yes, Charmian. The Lady Sophia Sefton never did gallop her horse up the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral. Didn't she, Charmian? And she couldn't help her name being bandied from mouth to mouth, or hiccoughed out over slopping wine glasses, could she? No, said I, frowning. What a young fool I was. And Peter? Well, Charmian, she never was, and never will be, buxom or strapping, will she? Buxom is such a hateful word, Peter. And you, love her? Wait, Peter, as much as you ever loved Charmian Brown? Yes, said I, yes. And nearly as much as your dream woman? More, much more, because you are the embodiment of all my dreams. You always will be, Charmian, because I honor you for your intellect and worship you for your gentleness and spotless purity and love you with all my strength for your warm, sweet womanhood and because you are so strong and beautiful and proud. And because, Peter because I am just your loving, humble person. And thus it was I went forth a fool, and toiled and suffered and loved, and in the end got me some little wisdom. And thus did I, all unworthy as I am, win the heart of a noble woman, whose love I pray will endure, even as mine will, when we shall have journeyed to the end of this broad highway, which is life, and into the mystery of the beyond. End of In Which This History Is Ended End of the Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnall